Yeah, the more okay. convenient technology gets, like the easier it like is to fuck it up somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Sorry for folks who are seeing this silly stuff. We are trying our best. <laughs> ah, that is all they can ask for. Who's your guys? Uh like least favorite bad guy of the story i personally would say ebert yeah ebert's probably if you could call him a bad guy i don't know like i would i would say like he's pretty unequivocally a bad guy not nordsk noska noska yeah he kind of sucks too a lot yeah all right (laughs) we swear we're trying guys uh let us know (laughs) Oh man, I hate Streamlabs so much. Uh, we're doing our best. We'll be starting soon. If folks are tuning in, you can hear this. Um, it says we're live now. So, oh <laughs> yeah, we're live. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, can you guys, uh, Izzy and Simba, can you go uh, and check if it's uh, you're getting sound on your end? Because I don't. I just want to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting sound. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, great. So I'm going to go ahead and start us then. So uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, part four of our live stream study group on the German Revolution by Pierre mm-hmm. Bruet, which is a big old book on uh, one of the most pivotal times in the history of the socialist movement. It's also uh, a very tragic one. Um, So over the last uh, couple weeks, we've been uh, reading this book about four chapters at a time. And the way that these streams work is that we we read about... uh, We we read and then summarize what we read. Um, and then we, I'd say we spend about the first hour or so uh, doing the summary, and then we spend the latter hour uh, discussing. Uh, I have with me uh, today, we've got uh, Young Simba uh, and Izzy Does Everything. Those are my uh, co-hosts today. Uh, our usual our resident uh, history grad student, Labor Kyle, uh, couldn't make it today, so uh, we're covering for him. Uh, He sent me his notes, though, so I will be covering his section. Um, And uh, if you're feeling a little bit lost, uh, you can go back and watch our old streams. Uh, There are three before this one where we talk about the first um, 10 chapters. Today we're going to be covering chapters uh, 11 through 14, which is, uh, I'm showing it on our screen now it's uh the foundation the chapter 11 covers the foundation of the communist party of germany uh chapter 12 covers the uprising of january 1919 uh chapter 3 covers the period where uh gustav noska takes over and um kind of local military and police command and starts uh wrecking shit um, and then in chapter 14, uh, t- it talks about the stabilization in Germany and world revolution and kind of situates uh, where this abortive revolution fits into the rest of the world socialist movement of the time. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to switch over to uh, our screen share here, and I'm going to start reading um Kyle's notes on chapter 11, which are uh, all about the foundation of the German Communist Party. Um, Simba, you're uh, not uh, showing up on screen if you want to. You don't have to if you don't want to, but so far all I have is uh, Izzy here on screen. Oh. Uh, I should be. Oh, okay. Yeah, your video's off. Ooh. Do you do you want to show up or is that okay if you're? Yeah, I'll attempt to fix it, and if I can't, then I guess I just won't. 
No, that's all right. Uh, well, we can, while we're waiting for you to do that, we can uh, uh, go around real quick and do uh, introductions. So um, I'll start. I'm uh, Melody, she, her pronouns. Um, this is my channel, A World to Win, where I talk about um, history, political theory, and current events and other things from a Marxist-Leninist perspective. Um, I'm an activist in uh, Portland, Oregon with the Portland DSA, and I'm uh, associated with the uh, Red Caucus, the uh, Communist Caucus of DSA. Um, I don't represent them in any official capacity, I'm just uh, uh, <laughs> stating that. <laughs> this is uh, my own project, my own private uh, educational uh, Marxist project here. So uh, I'm going to hand things off to my other co-hosts so they can introduce themselves before we get started here. I am Izzy uh, from Izzy Does Everything. It's really just me doing like angry anarchist rants and like trans representation and vlogs now. I did that today. Um, but yeah, uh, I am a member of the IWW, and I use she, they pronouns. Oh, hi, Simba. Hello. Okay, so you can see me now? Uh-huh. Yep, you're awesome. good. Awesome. Cool, cool. Uh, you can go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no you're, uh, it's your turn to introduce yourself. Yes. Unless, wait, Izzy, were you done introducing yourself? I, I, I am done. I see, I see your bird back there being super happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's Mango. All birds are comrades. <laughs> All birds are comrades. Sometimes, though, he gets a little rowdy, usually not during the evening, so I think it'll probably be okay. But, I mean, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, in any case, I am young Simba. I, uh, I'm i from D.C., and uh, I currently live in Appalachia, though, and I'm also a wobbly, so once again... Uh, Melody, I think I think you're unfortunately always going to be the the odd one out with wobblies on the street. I'll join one of these days, guys. I swear. One of these days, <laughs> maybe even two if we're lucky. Uh, but um, yeah. So I uh, g generally um, oh I do have a YouTube channel and I'm going to cover mostly uh, Black and Indigenous issues right now. My project is going through primary sources of the Black Panther Party and. Uh, like breaking them down as much as I can to try and accurate, accurately uh, represent what they stand for and uh, what they did to the best of my ability. Um, beyond that, though, I'm Zimbabwean and I like am like Marxist Leninist aligned kind of, but not really ideologically committed, if that gives you any idea of, of um, where I stand on those kinds of topics. Oh, they them. Cool. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, and uh, we just want to, uh, of course, disclaim at the beginning of this stream, uh, as we do every time, that we are not uh, academics or experts of any kind, uh, with our usual uh, co-host Kyle being the exception there. So we're just, you know, curious people who uh, are reading a, a very, admittedly, a very difficult book uh, and trying to kind of pick apart what we read and uh, digest it and discuss it and so that, um, you know, hopefully uh, we can uh, make this a little bit more palatable to a lay audience and, uh, you know, ourselves learn in the process. This is, you know, uh, we try to set this up just like you would with a, a regular study group uh, in person, right? So, um, and uh, hopefully uh, I originally had... Uh, invited uh, Associate Professor of History uh, Axel Fair-Schultz from uh, site, uh, the State University of New York in Potsdam. Uh, he originally said he was going to join us, but I have not heard back from him yet, so uh, I will make sure to introduce him if he's able to come on, but uh, we're not going to count on him showing up today, so uh, unfortunately. Uh, but if he if he can show up, that's great, and we will welcome him on the show. Um, anyhow, so without further ado, let's get into Chapter 11, the foundation of the German Communist Party. So, um, the last time we talked about the uh, s original split in the um, Social Democratic movement was between uh, the kind of the old ossifying party structure of the Social Democratic Party, the SPD, um, and what would become the 
the new party, the independent uh, Social Democratic Party, the USPD, which uh, was constituted of an alliance between kind of the revolutionary folks like um, like uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Lieb- uh, Liebknecht and uh, others, uh, and the kind of uh, the so-called centrists like Karl Kotsky and uh, Edward Bernstein. Um, so there was kind of an uneasy alliance between them, but they said, okay, well, the SPD voted for uh, war credits in 1914, and we can't have that nonsense because that's not uh, good socialist uh, solidar- international socialist solidarity. So they split. But uh, as any ally- anyone knows with uh, alliances with uh, revolutionaries and uh, reformists, uh, things are never quite so stable. So we're getting into this chapter now with the kind of the tensions between the the, uh, centrists and the revolutionaries kind of boiling over and precipitating a split, a further split in the German uh, socialist movement. So we're going to get into this uh, in this chapter talking about um, kind of the main disagreements and how uh, this set the stage for the instability and uh, this is uh, Bruet's words on page uh, 225, if you want to follow along. He says, it was doomed to impotence before it had swung into action. Um, so, uh, this, uh, according to Kyle's notes here, the chief disagreements in the forming of the party emerged from the Bremen communist elements of the IKD, the, in, uh, the International Communists of Germany, uh, different interpretations of Bolshevism, the role of trade unions, uh, and the centralism marked the divisions between the Spartacists, um, which is uh, like Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, and the uh, the IKD. Uh, the IKD was a group that had split off long ago. They had um, basically sensed They smelled the blood in the water. They sensed treachery from day one. So they said, F this, we're going to go, we're going to go start our own communist party. Um, So they, so they did. Um, So let's see. Um, So they were basically deciding on things like, should we break off formally um, before or after the next party Congress? Uh, the Spartacists vote 80 to 3 to leave the SPD and start a new uh, party in December of 1918. Um, so, in uh, in this conference, uh, Karl Liebknecht uh, has a, a passionate attack against uh, revisionism uh, and the bureaucratic parliamentary priorities that took precedence over Max action. Uh, to quote Liebknecht, uh, we joined the USPD in order to drive forward uh, through our efforts uh, all those who we could, who could be driven. It was a labor of Sisyphus, uh, page 214. So to just remind folks real quick, we're going to be dropping a lot of uh, kind of very specific terminology and and that kind of thing, and we're going to try to introduce them as we go along. Some of them we introduce in our in our older streams, but it never hurts to kind of uh, hammer on them again and remind folks and remind ourselves, of course, what they mean. So um, the term revisionist refers to uh, the kind of reformist uh, current of social democrats. Um, the idea of the the way, the way that where the word rev- revisionist comes from is that uh, they had, uh, it was actually a self-described notion, they were revising Karl Marx's theory that uh, capitalism's internal instabilities would make um, capitalism totally unsustainable and that it would eventually lead to um, worse and worse crises that would not be able to be managed. And Uh, The revisionists basically saw the way that the uh, economy was going and said, oh, it looks like capitalism is uh, working out okay. We don't need to worry about it. Um, So, And we can just kind of reform our way into socialism. And um, so this is what uh, the term revisionism means, just so we're um, really clear on that. And... uh, that was promulgated by, uh, foremost by Edward Bernstein. 
so uh, the question of whether or not to advance uh, against the Constituent Assembly and take part in the elections uh, was another item on the agenda. Uh, Keitha Dunka said, uh, you wish to lance a boil which has not yet ripened. That's a lovely image for you. <laughs> and oh, uh, nice. Otto uh, Rule uh, says, today we have other platforms. The street is a huge platform that we have won and we should not abandon, even if they should shoot us. Uh, page two, uh, 217. That's uh, a right there. Yeah, so... The, their Congress rules uh, 62 to 23 not to participate in the elections. Uh, other questions on the agenda. How should the party work with traditional trade unionism? Uh, Luxembourg's position cuts between the arguments uh, and hers eventually wins out. The liquidation of the unions in favor of f newly formed workers' councils was on the table, but not a full... Uh, the, the phrase that... The, all kind of the, the far far left was was saying was we need to leave the unions just wholesale, um, and this section ends with uh, Rosa and particularly her emphasis on the potential uh, phases of the revolution and the necess uh, the necessity for patience. Um, so why is this founding Congress so important? Uh, the bitterness which set the stage for the founding of the KPD's isolation from the more militant and activated elements of the German working class, the discussions outlined between the Spartacist delegation and the revolutionary delegation uh, appropriately illustrates these conflicts, uh, page 224 to 225. Um, so just to clarify that, the, de the revolutionary delegation are the uh, folks that um, like Karl Radek that uh, Moscow had had sent to uh, basically uh, help with the with, with the situation there. Um, at, as we'll recall, the uh, Russian Revolution, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, had brought the working class to power in Russia in uh, October of 1917, and uh, so one of their uh, principal goals in this period was to unite with the other, uh, you know, the revolutionary uh, current, the revolutions that were spreading all over um, Europe. Uh, let's see. Uh, Brue ends this uh, chapter appropriately with an optimistic quote from uh, Lenin. Uh, do, do, do. I'm so sorry. It helps us see how the his, uh, lens of historical distance can often paper over underlying conflicts that are revealing uh, what is to come before it and what happens. Uh, as people who are looking at history, uh, we need to kind of view that a little bit dispassionately, right? So there's this, I think, kind of tendency to, uh, especially us with the benefit of hindsight, to kind of look back and go, ah, yeah, if I had been there, I would have known the whole time. And I think the, the, the theme that's going to kind of resonate throughout these chapters that we're talking about today is, um, you know, even the absolute best and brightest revolutionaries of this movement, they were still, you know, and they had a, a, a very, you know, uh, you know, cutting analysis of the situation, and so they were still often running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Um, you know, so it, it's it's uh, we need to be as as people reading history and learn trying to learn from it. It's uh, I think a little it can be there's a temptation to kind of have this um, presumptuous reading of, oh yeah, if I had been there, I would have done this, that, or the other thing. It's like, yeah, but how would you have known how to do that? <laughs> like, um, right. So uh, I'm going to also now uh, look at my notes on chapter 11 um, because uh, I'm able to draw from my notes a little bit more directly uh and kyle's are uh written in a style that's that are um you know they're they're geared towards uh, the way that he likes to talk about things and mine are written in a little bit more linear fashion um
just contemplate here. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, um, so... Uh, <laughs> one thing that's really worthy of note in this chapter is that uh, despite the fact that, um, you know, uh, many of the, the revolutionaries all across Europe were very much looking to the Bolsheviks as an example of um, how to take things to the next level and, and you know, win a revolution. Uh, they really uh, weren't very well informed as to how they did it. And I think they had a lot of kind of uh, oh, they really, there's no way that they kind of could have been because, you know, so all this stuff was so, you know, fresh, uh, in, uh, and, uh, you know, there's just the pace of events is, is so, so difficult, so difficult to keep up with. Um, and so, but despite kind of the, uh, their, the KPDs, uh, looking up to the Bolsheviks, they were still structured much more like, uh, the USPD, so they were still had a kind of a, a very bureaucratic orientation, and uh, indeed they weren't, uh, according to Bruet, they weren't terribly well structured at all, uh, which is in marked contrast to uh, how the Bolsheviks were structured, because they had had, you know, uh, nearly 20 years of uh, experience as not just a revolutionary uh, group, but like specifically like an illegal one. They had been, you know, forced to, to do most of their activities underground in Russia, uh, being an illegal party, uh, whereas uh, the Germans were not dealing with those problems. Uh, they were a legal parliamentary party, and they had all the kind of accompanying, um, I won't, uh, I won't say comforts, but uh, things that perhaps make uh, organization that are uh, conducive to certain kind of organizations over others. And the fact that the Bolsheviks had had, you know, kind of 20 years to, uh, you know, of collective cumulative experience and, st and strategizing and so on and so on uh, mm -hmm. meant that they had uh, some pretty distinct advantages over this uh, very uh, nascent um communist movement in Germany, which was, uh, you know, just starting to uh, form basically out of a much less radical current overall. Um, so let's see, I've got more notes here. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, one of the uh, things that the Bolsheviks had that the uh, German radicals were weary of, especially Luxembourg, was uh, centralism, which is to say, you know, a tightly controlled nucleus of, uh, you know, direction and whatnot. And the German experience with that had been quite the opposite uh, of the Bolsheviks. Uh, the Germans' experience with, uh, you know, centralism was uh, the SPD, which was very bureaucratic uh, and very uh, kind of prone to, to these... Uh, uh, you know, oss ossifying tendencies that were going to kind of uh, uh, stick things in the mud, whereas, you know, the centralism that had taken shape in the Bolshevik party was much more of a, like, necessity of being an illegal group and um, and so on. So uh, there was a real kind of uh, weariness of, or excuse me, not weariness, wariness on the part of the German revolutionaries to the centralized style structure of the Bolshevik party. This is my reading of it. Um, despite the clear lack of uh, organization, Liebknecht nevertheless, nevertheless praised the activists as the best and brightest of the uh, Berlin proletariat uh, over and above the so-called high priests of the USPD. Um, Ultra-left dick-waving abounded, the KPD was isolated from day one, and just as Luxembourg had feared with the USPD split before it. So, uh, just to review real quick, uh, last time we talked about the split between the uh, 
SPD and the USPD, and one of the reasons that uh, Luxembourg was uh, specifically, and, and others uh, were specifically opposed to it, was that they feared that they would be um, isolated, that, you know, they would, uh, they'd be more ideologically uh, pure, right? They would be uh, more radical, more uh inclined to, you know, stick to their guns in terms of their principles and stuff, but they would be, you know, they wouldn't have access to the to the masses in the same way that they did in the party. And as you'll recall, if you if you go back and watch our old stream, um, they, you know, the, the split happened very reluctantly on the part of the radicals. The radicals were were not super keen about splitting, and it was really the uh, the kind of the old stuffy old bureaucrats in the SPD that were really kind of trying to push them out of the party and force a split, but also having their cake and eating it too by, you know, calling the, the radicals, the, oh, you're a bunch of wreckers. Uh, <laughs> this is actually your fault. Um, so that pretty much wraps up chapter 11. Um, going into chapter 12 here, which I'm also going to summarize, um, Things are I kind of, maybe offer a bit of a content warning here because things are about to get really ugly and really violent and really sad, and uh, we'd hate to bring you down, but this is uh, this is not a happy revolution. <laughs> um, yeah, if you um, if you want to make it somewhat more um, I guess easy to swallow, take a shot every time that uh, somebody is accused of trying to escape. Oh uh, yeah, shot. no, that's rough. <laughs> shot, like, because of it, yeah, seriously, that happens like a bunch. You're, you're not. I mean, if you're reading along and you do that, like you're not going to be able to finish. <laughs> um, but yes, a bit of a bit of a content warning. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a big case of stop resisting, kind of mm -hmm. like yeah. <laughs> uh, just a moment. Okay, so moving right along. Um, so things are uh, the the KPD, as we kind of as I kind of said a moment ago, is kind of a mess. Uh, and uh, Rosa says of this, um, a newborn child uh, always squalled at first, like basically, you know, oh, it's you know just a little baby party, you know, right? It's it's always going to have kind of those uh, those um, you know, th those, uh, ugly first steps, right? You can never, uh, a little baby party has to, has to be able to crawl before it can walk. So she believed deeply that the party would find its feet because, uh, well, after all, they really did have kind of the best and brightest of the, of the revolutionaries and of the, they had, you know, very deep connections to the militant workers movement and so on. So, you know, it was a totally an unreasonable assumption for them to say, uh, oh, uh, we're going, you know, we've got the best and brightest uh, and maybe things are looking a little rough now, but, you know, we've got um, good people on our side and, and, and uh, you know, uh, iron principles and so on, I think we'll be okay. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe not, I don't think they would necessarily that optimistic, but I, uh, they were certainly... Uh, at least Rosa was uh, optimistic about, uh, at the very least, the prospects of what they could do with their party. Um, so, but these are all, you know, disp whether you are an optimist or a pessimist at this time would have been totally understandable either way, because uh, there's just so much chaos in this period, and uh, as we're going to get into here. So, uh the party and the workers' councils were uh, weak and disorganized, but the masses of Germany were radicalizing very quickly, and the Ebert government was uh, going to shit very quickly. Um, excuse me for just a moment. I think I might be getting a message from uh, our professor. Uh, let's see here. Oh, well, he's not going to be able to make it. That's all right. Uh -huh. 
Oh, well. Okay. Well, moving right along. Um, the Abert government is uh, kind of collapsing on itself, and uh, all these uh, soldiers who are soldiers and sailors who are coming home from World War I uh, are absolutely fed up uh, and not uh, super into this uh, uh, stuff that's going on at home. Um, the army was, uh, the officers were losing control of the army. Uh, shit was getting really wild and disorganized. Uh, and, but nevertheless, like there were like, just so much just revolutionary ferment in the air. Like the people were getting radicalized very quickly. Uh, December 8th, 1918, uh, there, uh, a workers and soldiers council in Mülheim arrest several leading capitalists. Um, so, as I said, the officers and the generals are kind of losing control of the army as all the soldiers and sailors are getting uh, Bolshevik fever, <laughs> as many as many uh, soldiers on the front were uh, in in Russia as well at the uh, at the when Russia was winding down its involvement in World War One, uh, there was something called trench Bolshevism, which was to say that uh, the uh, soldiers were, uh, say, calling themselves Bolsheviks, not out of any real strong convictions other than the fact that the Bolsheviks said they wanted to end the war. And so, uh, but uh, not saying that this is necessarily the same thing going on here, but uh, they were all uh, kind of the, the idea being that they were all very much uh, radicalizing. Um, and they were all going over to the side of the revolution. Um, there's a Congress of the councils, and it votes in a resolution which abolishes all marks of rank, uh, abolishes uh, discipline and wearing uh, uni uh, uniforms off duty, the abolition of external marks of, of respect, uh, election of officers by soldiers, uh, and transfer of army command to the soldiers' councils. Um, and in late December of 1918, uh, rumors of a military coup d'etat start to spread. Um, and so there's a, uh, a squabble over sailors' pay and... Uh, uh, a bunch of soldiers get uh, killed uh, over this, or so sailors get killed over this, and basically everyone blames uh, Ebert for it because he's in charge. Uh, Ebert, uh, Friedrich Ebert, is the uh, head of the social democratic uh, controlled government, and uh, he's, uh, if you want to think of a modern analog, he would be like... Uh, President Bernie Sanders. There you go. Uh, um, so uh, he was basically, in light of this um, incident, viewed as an accomplice of the military, and uh, so people are starting to turn against him. Uh, so a bunch of USPD commissars. Uh, resign and from the government and push the majority to be more dependent on the army chiefs and that's going to create a lot of I mean you can kind of see where that's heading it's uh, wrapping up the interests of the military and kind of the uh, the social Democrats um, and that's where things are heading uh, and they're only gonna get worse um, so uh, there's a, a crowd of uh, sailors at the uh, uh, at the funeral for those for those sailors. They're um, holding a, a banner th that explicitly calls out the heads of the government. So Ebert, Landsberg, and Scheidemann, uh, and explicitly calls them out for being responsible for the deaths of those sailors. And to just give you an idea of how up its own ass the Social Democrats were, they actually organize a counter demonstration to a funeral march. Like seriously, they organize a, a, 
a demonstration against the so-called bloody dictatorship of the Spartacists. Um, <laughs> so there's this great quote uh, that's... Uh, it's not related to that, but... Uh, the November Revolution had been victorious without a real battle. It had reinforced the myth of unity and sown the illusion that everything would be easy. Uh, the Spartacists and the Red Soldiers called for the formation of Red Guards, but um, they just did not have the uh, logistical capability to do so. They were, as I had kind of alluded to earlier, their whole structure was very uh, limited and kind of they were very disorganized and they simply also just did not have the numbers to sustain that um and the people's naval division units uh who were broadly on the side of the spartacists as well uh they were scattered and not politically unified whatsoever um so like that's another common theme throughout this is that a lot of people uh in trade unions or their soldiers and sailors are broadly speaking aligned with more radical views, but they're not necessarily like politically homogeneous. Um, so, you know, uh, the masses at this stage were, uh, starting to see, uh, armed struggle as the way forward, but unlike the Bolshevik revolution, uh, they didn't have a centralized party or organization to direct their activity and provide a coherent political program. Oh, the would-be leaders were giving contradictory signals to those looking uh, looking to them for direction. Uh, Gustav Noska, the Minister of Defense, along with uh, Rudolf uh, Wiesel and Paul Löbe, joined the government to replace the USPD ministers who had resigned. And uh, as a very kind of telling uh, and frankly chilling uh, prelude of what's to come, Noska said, uh, one of us has to do the job of executioner. And this is like mid-December of 1918. <laughs> so there's a, a conference. Uh, the government has a conference on the 6th of December. And this is really uh, where things are starting to look bad. Um, General Merker forms the Free Corps from his unit. It uh, was, uh, the Free Corps, uh, was explicitly designed for the purposes of, uh, counter-revolution, um, and specifically, like, they trained, trained and organized these units from the ground up to be, uh, a, a counter-revolutionary, uh, army for the purposes of waging a civil war. So, and what's this is what's really crucial to to note here is that unlike the revolutionaries and the workers who are um, disorganized and kind of directionless uh, and confused, the the free uh, free corps were uh, very well disciplined and knew exactly what they wanted. They were uh, to serve at the behest of the government and. Uh, put an end to this, uh, revolution nonsense. Uh, and they had a plan and they had good leadership and they were ready to go and, uh, things are going to get ugly and this is why. Um, so <laughs> those helming the counter revolution knew that they would have to act quickly and decisively to put down the revolution. And um, there's some uh, key, very key person here that I have to talk about, which is uh, Eichhorn. He's the police chief uh, during the November Revolution and a co-founder of the USPD. Um, and uh, despite the fact that he was the police chief, this is actually very important here because he's... Uh, it, it would be like, you know, he's a, this is a person who's relatively radical in charge of the police, somebody who's uh, very much on the side of revolution. Uh, and uh, so this is, and his, this, there's some events that involve him that are going to really make things, is going to stir the pot in a really nasty way. So uh, obviously the majority uh, SPD 
the Social Democrats did not want somebody who was so sympathetic with the revolution uh, in charge of the police. Um, but until the USPD ministers uh, resigned from the government, uh, they didn't really have the wherewithal to do that. But as soon as the USPD guys resigned, um, they had uh, they were uh, all teed up to get rid of him. So here's uh, there's kind of a critical sequence of events that happens uh, on the turn of the new year of 1919. So January 1st, um, the Social Democratic newspaper Vorwärts launches a smear campaign against Eichhorn, accusing him of receiving Russian gold as an employee of, uh, of the Rosta. Does that sound familiar to you? <laughs> Russia, 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 Russia. Anyway, <laughs> uh, January 3rd, uh, Eichhorn is summoned to the Ministry of the Ministry of Interior, and accused of swindling, armed robbery, and all a whole litany of bullshit that they wanted to stick him with. And then on January 4th, um, the Prussian cabinet dismisses him formally, but Eichhorn uh, actually refuses to leave his post. Um, he had very wide support from the left, including from the revolutionaries. Um, but so his dismissal provokes a massive outbreak of strikes and demonstrations and, you know, other things, protests and so on. And the KPD calls for, the Communist Party calls for a political strike demanding the cancellation of his dismissal and the disarming of counter-revolutionary troops and the arming of workers. But uh, in this uh, declaration that they, that they offer, they're very explicitly saying not to overthrow the government. They thought that that would be a bridge too far at this stage. They did want to do that eventually, but at uh, this stage they feared that you know they didn't have the numbers, the strength, etc., and this was just really about striking a blow back at them. And uh, to say, like, oh, let's go overthrow the government now would be kind of like a, a suicide mission at this stage, so let's not do that quite yet. Uh, Luxembourg says to over, overthrow would be premature. Nobody outside of Berlin would have had been able to really follow suit. That was according to Berlin, uh, excuse me, according to Luxembourg, that uh, if they were to try to overthrow the government, they would be pretty much just like, you know, isolated in Berlin. Um, so the morning of January 5th, uh, the revolutionaries, uh, the Communist Party, and the, the Moscow delegation called for a uh, demonstration. And the aim was, again, simply to kind of show that the revolutionary spirit was still alive and not, you know, again, not to, you know, riot or whatever. It was just to, you know, kind of rouse the masses and, and show, show the government that there's still revolution in the air. But... Uh, it ends up, this protest on the 5th ends up being uh, way bigger than the revolutionaries anticipate, and they, as I said, alluded to earlier, they really don't have a whole lot of organizational and logistical capacity, so they kind of don't know what to do with themselves. Uh, the streets of Berlin are filled with hundreds of thousands of people, but this uh, ends up being a total anticlimax because the revolutionary le leadership, uh, you've got, you know, ten, hundreds of thousands of people out in the streets of Berlin, you know, uh, demonstrating, and the revolutionaries uh, kind of didn't know what to do with themselves, and they didn't have a coherent program, and they didn't really know uh, what to do next. So uh, the crowd is out there since uh, basically nine in the morning in on January 5th, and they're there until almost five in the evening, and they just go home because the revolutionaries uh, and other, you know, leadership can't uh, basically just spends all day kind of deliberating and doesn't actually decide on a course of action. Um, this is not just for like no reason either. Like, again, it's, it's, I, I'm like, encouraging us to resist that temptation to be like, oh, well, they should have just, you know, struck, struck while the iron was hot and, you know, overthrown the government or whatever. It's just not that simple, right? Like, 
um, they weren't sure, you know, do we have like, what, what are the right forces in line and how do we go about this? And, uh, you know, so like they were like the leadership was super divided on this. Uh, Dorenbach had a very optimistic assessment of their forces, thought that they were ready. Um, but then the soldiers delegate Albrecht uh, disputed this assessment and uh, disputed uh, Dorenbach had basically said the sailors are raring to go and they're ready to, to, to fuck shit up. And Dorenbach, uh, or excuse me, Albrecht basically said, uh, who are you joking? You don't speak for the soldiers. And the sol- or the, you know, the sailors basically said, uh, no, we're, this is total misassessment of, uh, what, what they wanted. Uh, so, but the, the funny thing is, is that this meeting, uh, pretty much, uh, unanimously voted to attempt to overthrow, but this is long into, uh, long, uh, <laughs> long after, uh, kind of the, uh, this demonstration's over, uh, Damig uh, rebuked this as adventurism and left the meeting. He wanted nothing to do with it. Um, shortly, or excuse me, at the same time of the meeting, there was an armed occupation of Vorwärts by workers, followed by similar actions at newspaper firms um, at that night, on the night of the uh, 5th-6th of January. The Revolutionary Committee was clumsy, and they called for another demonstration for the next day. Uh, so the proclamation of the joint proclamation of the USPD and KPD announcing the overthrow uh, that they had decided on the night before uh, never sees the light of day. It never comes out. Uh, so, like I said, their leadership is 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 not doing so great, and they're very disorganized. And this is kind of symptomatic of that. Um, as I said, the sailors were pissed that Dorenbach had kind of spoken on their behalf, and they did not necessarily want to overthrow the government. Um, so what else happens here? Uh, a detachment of 300 men occupied the Ministry of War under the orders of the Revolutionary Committee. Uh, and so the events of uh, the 6th of January kind of laid bare how unprepared everyone was. Uh, the revolutionaries were disunited and confused over what to do next. The masses had, you know, were they were rearing to go for something, but they didn't really have, they didn't really know uh, what to do next. Um, so I'm going to just see how we're doing for time here, because there's a lot more in this chapter to get through, and I want to make sure, because there's so much important things. Um, Izzy or Simba, do you want to uh, make any uh, comments? I can take a quick break while you guys um, speak a little bit. On chapter 12? Or? Yeah, we're still in chapter 12. Yeah, right, right. Um, you pretty much already talked about all of the things that I personally would want to talk I mean, up until this point, would want to talk about, yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, between uh, chapters 12 and 13, this is like the absolute, like, most confusing and like, th- there's just shit happening everywhere. And uh, Brewer's writing style doesn't, doesn't make that any easier to digest, <laughs> I- I'll say, personally. Um, what about you, Izzy? Is there anything in uh, chapter 12 that you wanted to address? Other than this whole thing just being a colossal clusterfuck, like, not really. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely, like, the right word for what's going on. Like, you know shit's fucked when even, like, the most, like, militant, like, smart people are, like, still basically chasing their tails. Like, I cannot even imagine being in their shoes. That sounds like such yeah. a nightmare. Right, um, yeah, I mean... Especially not with the the fry core that was pretty. I mean that that happens in this chapter, right? Yeah, the, we're getting to that. It's about to okay. get real ugly. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's when that's when things really pop off, in my opinion. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, well, Izzy gets to talk about uh, the, the Nazca shit, so that's right, right. that's going to be a, a nightmare. I've got, mm-hmm. let's see, I want to see how many more pages of notes I want to get through here. Um, and is I the think Nazca it's always... period, like, the longest chapter thus far in the book? Or... Yeah, I think this is, yeah, absolutely. I think this chapter is close to, like, 30 or 40 pages or something, so mm-hmm. we yeah. did, the between the four of us, we did... Uh, quite a bit of reading this week, this last two weeks. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but this chapter is like, I realize that my summary might be kind of going on and on and on, but this chapter is really dense and there's a lot, of, you can hear me ruffling through my notebook here, there's a lot to get through. And, like, I just wanted to make sure that we had a moment to kind of let things breathe and, you know, talk about any kind of points of confusion or whatever. So um, I'm glad that uh, we, we can do that. And we'll have plenty of time to discuss afterwards, of course, but just um, making sure that we're covering all our bases here. Okay, um, so, um... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please, please, I was done. Yeah, just, just uh, like, let's use this this time right now as like a kind of recapping the major events and talking about who the major factions are, I guess. Yeah. If that's sure. all possible. So, so you, Oh yeah. No, no. Take it away. All right. You got, uh, the USPD. Um, we've got the Ebert government, um, a whole lot of civilians who don't really take anybody's side particularly. <laughs> um, who else right now? There's, oh yeah, there's the KPD, which is like the, not necessarily the ultra left, but like the people who are more left than the USPD, which is sort of less organized, but doing the same thing that the SPD was doing, just trying to do it better. Is that a fair, fair way to put that? Yes, no? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a pretty healthy way of putting it. Sorry, okay. I'm, kinda, I'm dealing with a couple of things on my end here. You're good. You're good. Um, Izzy, do you have an objection to that? Uh, I, I, I sort of, but I can't quite recall what it was because I'm like really tired. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I got you. I mean, Brue is really good at got, getting a lot of information there, like just out in the open. Um, but it's like such a jumble of things and it's also just, uh, disorienting. I couldn't imagine like being there and Ah. doing, doing everything they did. Like despite the, the level of organization that they were at, the fact that they could get into this much of a mess, like, or the country itself could get into this much of a mess is like, holy shit. Um, yeah. So the USPD at this point is like. It has a left wing, but it has like a majority like right wing kind of leadership and they're they're doing what they're doing democratically, but like the the leadership uh, doesn't reflect the opinions of of what I would understand to be the majority of the party. Um, Oh, and then sailors. What's up with with communists and sailors? You got like. This whole thing, and then uh, wasn't the Kronstadt Rebellion also about sailors? Yeah, which is not something that I really know how to talk about, because it's not something I'm super familiar with. Um, yeah, that's, that's fine. But, I mean, uh, I presume that you're talking about what happened after the Bolshevik Revolution, but I also, right. you know, yeah. the, the Kronstadt sailors were also... Like prior to the revolution, like the island, like the island of Kronstadt was like a hotbed of of radicalism. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that, you know. I think maybe uh, very. Different I, I'm just musing here, but I think the the whole you know being uh, stuck in a giant metal box floating on a bunch of liquid death um, will make a communist out of anybody i don't know <laughs> i don't know just musing yeah. here like you're under like absolutely disgusting conditions in in especially in this era right i mean <laughs> it's not to say every single sailor became a communist but like 
it's it's easy for me it's it's easy to imagine kind of being stuck in that situation and thinking to yourself gee this is ass my officers treat me like shit um mm-hmm. i'm in, stuck in this cold shitty smelly metal tub floating on the ocean uh i want to go home i miss my i miss my girlfriend i miss i miss my my kids whatever mm-hmm. you know <laughs> like fuck this yeah um, I think this has been good, but I think I need to, like, I still have a lot to get through in this chapter and I really want to make sure that we're able to, to do the, our whole summary today. So I'm going to keep moving things along. Okay. Um, okay. so Berlin workers ready to strike and protest, but, um, they're not quite ready for, a uh, full on like armed conflict. Uh, and it's at this point. Uh, on the night of January 6th that Noska install is installed at the Free Corps uh, headquarters and they're starting to, to read, ready themselves for a counterattack. Um, and this is the point at which the Central Committee on the Executive of uh, the, the SPD uh, approve uh, of Icorn's uh, dismissal, uh, and that's basically kind of, uh, if my read is correct, it's kind of the last thing uh, holding things together uh, um, in terms of like, you know, being kind of a stopgap against uh, getting uh, horse fucked by the Frank War. Um, anyhow, so it's at this very inopportune time <laughs> that there is a crisis in the Communist Party. Uh, so uh, Karl Radek, who is in hiding, sends a message via Dunka to the Central Committee of the KPD advising the strikers to go back to work um, immediately and start a campaign for uh, the re-election of the workers' councils. Luxembourg replies to him, says... Uh, The USPD was getting ready to cave in, and the KPD shouldn't make their job any easier, but she also thought that a retreat was necessary. So, like, it's kind of, it's easy to see it for us in hindsight, I guess, but, like, it's, 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 you know, they're, these are very smart people dealing with incredibly complex situation here. Um, And it was not by any means perfect information here. Uh, Leo Jokic uh, wanted the Central Committee to disavow uh, Liebknecht and Wilhelm Pieck for acting without a mandate and breaking party discipline, but the uh, Central Committee basically ag- agreed with them, but they also didn't want to do that publicly because they figured that this would just cause more disarray. Uh, <laughs> And the USPD was also divided, which was uh, they sent from uh, their executive to convince the Berliners that they had to negotiate, and the Revolutionary Committee uh, agreed to do so by a vote of 51 against 10. The night of uh, January 6th-7th, the negotiations begin. Uh, the USPD wanted armistice, including a clause for the buildings occupied by the revolutionaries to be evacuated. Uh, the government made an unconditional evac, uh, an unconditional evacuation, a absolute precondition for any agreement. The SPD at this stage had made it clear that the night before, uh, decrying the Spartacists as madmen and criminals. Like the, the, the SPD could not be clear that they are absolutely it. They're in absolute opposition to the, to the revolutionaries. They, you know, there's at this stage, there's no pretending. Um, so at this stage, uh, Noska, uh, prepares the Fry Corps for intervention and gives, uh, police powers to general von Lutwitz, uh, Ebert and Scheidemann denounce uh, the attempt to erect the dictatorship of Liebknecht and Luxembourg, uh, calling on the citizens of Germany for <clears throat> help. Uh, so hours later, in the Reichstag, uh, establishing a social democratic army unit, uh, January 8th, 
two regiments of six companies are organized at the Reichstag of these so-called social democratic uh, army units. Uh, and the ministers meet and prepare for battle. And by nightfall uh, on January 8th, uh, the negotiations uh, just totally break down uh, and uh, clusterfuckery ensues. More clusterfuckery ensues. Uh, the government issues an appeal to the people vowing to fight violence with violence and stop, quote, oppression and anarchy. <laughs> Uh, Liebknecht denounces uh, the desertion of the USPD leaders to the workers occupying uh, Vorwärts, uh, that also, I believe, included uh, among those workers was uh, Liebknecht's son. Uh, January 9th, the, um, K uh, the KPD and the Berlin, three of the Berlin uh, independence um, social democrats uh, respond to the government proclamation with a call to arms. The workers were not receptive, and meetings and assemblies all came out against uh, fratricidal violence between socialists and demanded unity. So, despite the fact that, um, you know, again, like it's very clear for us as reading this that shit is hitting the fan, and that, um, you know, the the, maybe the clear thing to do would be, you know, take up arms and and uh, resist the, you know, the kind of incipient uh, proto-fascism before it's too late. But, um, you know, m most people in this situation were still convinced, like, there's just people are just killing each other for no reason. This is stupid. You know, let's, we can just, you know, be united and... Uh, there's a, 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 a quote from a declaration that says, workers unite, if not with your leaders, at least over their heads. So uh, there's kind of a, a universal, near universal feeling among the, the people that this was a bunch of, you know, just silly infighting between socialists and let's just whatever. Um, so under pressure from the demonstrators, the negotiations resumed on uh, January 9th on uh, the evening and continue to uh, the 11th with the government delegation led by Hermann Müller. Uh, in the meantime, however, uh, the government had regained a lot of ground and it's, it's bad. Like, oh my God. So um, on the 8th, the government forces uh, reoccupy the Anhalt uh, train station and the administration building of the railways. Uh, on January 9th, the government forces reoccupy the Reich uh, printing establishment and lay siege to Vorwärts. Uh, and on the 10th, uh, guards regiments attack in Spandau, which is at this point kind of a hotbed of insurrection. Uh, a ch the chairman of the workers' council there is killed in the fighting. The chairman of the soldiers' council there, um, the Spartacist um, Max von Loyevsky, is arrested and then murdered along with some of his comrades. And then uh, on the kind of the night of the 10th and 11th of January, uh, Ledebor and the Spartacist uh, Ernst Mayer are arrested. Uh, in the morning of the 11th of January, uh, troops bega began shelling the Vorwärts building, um, which is, I used to imagine that for a second, like, a freaking army is is literally shelling yeah, the, a newspaper that, headquarters. What, was it like, uh, a, like hours or something? For two hours. Yeah, straight two hours. Yeah, just... so at which point they they uh, surrender and they send out a delegation to, you know, negotiate the surrender. Uh, and uh, they say, okay, we accept your surrender. And then they murdered a bunch of them on the spot. Um, and by the evening, uh, the soldiers recaptured not just uh, Vorwärts, but also the uh, Wolf News Agency, which was also occupied on the 12th, uh, an attack on the police headquarters with uh, 
three hundred there are three hundred insurgents occupying it, and the uh, communist uh, Eustace Braun is killed there with several others, and um, all of this just chaos and brutality only caused more confusion for the revolutionary committee. Uh, the central committee of the KPD was totally disorganized by this. They had had no contact with Karl Liebknecht for several days. He had been um, with the leadership of the USPD. Uh, Paul Levy and Karl Radek met and agreed that uh, they're fucked. <laughs> um, uh, they had planned, uh, Levy and Radek had planned to intervene in the workers' meetings on the night of the 9th uh, to organize a retreat, but uh, they gave up when they realized that they had kind of missed the boat. Um, and the KPD in this period basically ends up isolating itself even further. Um, and this, the SPD is really like, you, they're able to set them up and use them as kind of being the main villains at this point. Uh, and it's at, at this point that uh, Rosa Luxemburg, who had up until then uh, been very critical of, as I said earlier, kind of that centralist approach of party organization organized by uh, uh, of uh, the Bolsheviks uh, and Lenin, and she was uh, starting to kind of warm up to it because she saw, uh, you know, was watching all the shit hitting the fan around her and kind of... I think maybe coming around to to Lenin's view on centralization a bit more, um, just because, as you can see, like you know, this uh, organization is is like one of the key things that's that's keeping the communists so hamstrung. Uh, so Rosa, yeah, she... sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just gonna say, I think she she like maybe even slightly less than a month before she was unfortunately uh, killed, like writes in a letter that's delivered uh, in that's mentioned in the chapter that I'm going to discuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I've just got a little bit more to, to cover here. And this is unfortunately where we're going to find out where the uh, Bernie killed Rosa meme comes from. Cause it comes from this. Um, I will be right back. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're good. Um, so this at this point, the Free Corps starts uh, actively hunting down the revolutionary leadership. Uh, Dornbach, Eichhorn, and Schulze are all able to flee the capital, um, Berlin, but uh, Rosa and uh, Karl Liebknecht stay. Um, they were kind of unaware of the level of danger that they were in. I mean, I think they were all aware of the danger they're in in some sense that you know they're in an incredibly uh you know uh, incredibly dangerous situation in general so i don't think they maybe realized the extent of the danger that they specifically were in um so they uh their comrades are telling them you re you guys really need to hide and they both kind of resist that um because they want to continue their their you know their work their revolutionary work. Um, eventually, they're both convinced that yeah okay let's hide, uh, but we're gonna we have we're gonna hide but we're gonna stay in Berlin they demand, um, which is to say, um, they wanted to basically they, they, as long as shit was still going down in Berlin they wanted to stay there, uh, they wanted to be in solidarity with the workers being repressed, so they uh, hid. First at uh, Neukölln on the night of the twelfth uh, and thirteenth of January, and then uh, later in Wilmersdorf. And uh, it's at this point that Rosa reads the newspaper and discovers uh, that Liebknecht had signed the document, the notorious document of the Revolutionary Committee. And there's a very awkward silence between them. <laughs> so uh, here's where things start getting really ugly. So on the January the 15th, uh, Rosa and Liebknecht, along with uh, Wilhelm Pieck, are arrested and taken to the Hotel 
uh, Eden and interrogated by General Pabst. Uh, they were both escorted that night uh, to be imprisoned in the Mobut, the prison, uh, big, I think, military prison, if memory serves me right there. Uh, and then on the 16th, uh, Forwärts is the only newspaper to announce their arrest, uh, but they make sure to very triumphantly uh, congratulate the generosity of their captors, uh, which is just really sick. If you if if you think about it, is this, 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 these are supposedly socialists that are running uh, Forwärts, but they're the socialists who are the ones who are. Uh, <laughs> arresting revolutionaries and and so on um so by midday on the 16th it's announced that both had been killed they were both uh killed after being uh tortured by the soldiers who were holding them uh and one of the soldiers who tortured them was uh known his name was uh, runga uh liebknecht's body and this is just really just horrific here. Liebknecht's body was dropped off at the zoo police station and reported as an unidentified corpse. And Rosa's body was weighted down with stones and tossed into the canal and would only be recovered several months later. This was all coordinated by uh, a man, one Lieutenant Vogel, uh, and they would both... Uh, face reprisals eventually in May. Uh, Runga and Vogel would both be court martialed for this and sentenced to uh, two and two and a half years uh, in prison, respectively. But this was effectively kind of a slap on the wrist because, in the case of Vogel, the judge basically helped him escape uh, and he was able to flee abroad. So uh, thanks for bearing with me there. That was all of chapter 12 that we just covered, and I know it's a lot. Um, so Simba and, and Izzy, if you want to kind of uh, chew on that before uh, I, I hand things over to you guys to summarize your sections, that would be fantastic. I will be right back myself. I need to make myself a fresh cup of tea. Fucking A cap. Holy shit. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, your audio is not coming through, Simba. Yeah, a cab. Um, you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you now. Cool. Uh, yeah, dude. So, you wanna you wanna help recap, or am I am I gonna gonna do this incredibly badly? Ah. Uh. It's just, that's a lot. That is a yeah. whole lot. <laughs> yeah, so the, the the nominally socialist government of Ebert now has uh, what amounts to like a private militia of politically motivated uh, dudes that dump bodies of people in rivers <laughs> and um, shell newspaper buildings. That's the thing that happens. There are strikes all over the place. I think at one point, Way even says that, no, no, actually, that's chapter Um, But this is post, post-World post War I Germany, so you can't yeah. imagine that the economic situation is very good. There's probably a whole oh. lot of... Oh, no, it's absolutely fucked. Yep, yep. Uh, inflation, which... There's an economic crisis in Germany uh, after World War One, and um, all economic crises under capitalism um, concentrate a whole lot of money in the hands of a very, very few people. And I actually am going to talk about that in my chapter, but that's probably going to be relevant at least somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Whew. it's not fun to be living in Germany. Yeah, no, 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 the slightest. It's, uh, I'm trying to find a word for it other than clusterfuck, but that's the only one that really works. I mean... Yeah, yeah. I mean, like... I mean, it is basically... Germany used confusion on itself, and it was super effective. You know what I mean? <laughs> it <laughs> like, itself in its confusion. <laughs> for real. 
<sighs> it's, yes. it's weird to think that like um, I don't know so like I don't want to get into alternative history but it's weird to think uh, that if if like because uh, because like Rosa Luxemburg and Carl Liebknecht, uh, like they had a whole lot of years to go. They just chose not to hide in the place that they did. They wouldn't have died, and like history would be completely different. I don't know. It would be. It would. It would definitely be like an interesting thing to like delve into another time. Sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, like yeah. one thing we got to remember though is that like the the reason they stayed in Berlin was not like like is because they were being committed revolutionaries. Like, you right. know, like yeah, it's, it's not, that, you know, yeah. it's easy oh. for us to kind of look back and say, Oh, if they had only, you know, hidden, if they'd only, you know, fled like, uh, you know, Dorenbach and the other guy, like if they had only done that, well, yeah, but then they wouldn't be fucking Carl, uh, Carl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. Right. right. Like exactly. that's, that's just like, that was, that was who they were. And that was, they were willing to, literally put their lives on the line for revolution right like i think it, it's kind of it's, it's a very stark reminder of like kind of the uh the very real kind of risks that we're knowingly taking on as 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 revolutionaries um you know like you have to be willing you have to like go forward recognizing that there's a probably uh, a lot of people who want you to end up at the bottom of a river. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think that that's, uh, uh, even if you're not a revolutionary, I think it's something that we in the, especially in the United States right now, uh, need to kind of keep in mind, which is that, you know, there's a significant portion of our population that thinks, uh, uh you know, anyone, uh, left of Hillary Clinton, uh, deserves the, the Luxembourg treatment. So, right. um, you know, because uh, his anti-socialist uh, um, politics are so uh, virulent here. Um, mm-hmm. Anyhow, so uh, I think we'll, we'll have more time to discuss this in our, in our discussion period, but um, we need to get through the rest of our summaries, which uh, I will right. hand <laughs> off to uh, Izzy and Simba now. Awesome. Let me just hit that so I can see things. All right. Holy shit. I got almost all the way through here uh, writing this down. So uh, we're going to have to, like, you know, uh, work together towards the end of this. We but, believe um, in you. Yeah, that's fine. We all did the reading, so we're we're good to go. Anyway. Well, the... F- no. Well, the fighting in January of 1919 uh, made it pretty clear that peaceful revolution was pretty much impossible uh democratic governance uh, shit the bed uh people were still dying cold and hungry in the streets it it was bad basically electoralism just did the huge um uh there was a thriving black market taking hold and uh, uh it was just it was uh managing to get its tendrils into every uh, uh every level of social strata every every class was being affected by it uh it was uh, a corrupting influence uh, uh, basically, uh, in this situation, the working class got completely fucked over by the same apparatuses which had been doing so the whole time. It was completely foobar. Um, uh, strikes were still going, uh, pretty strong, but people were losing resolve, uh, to fight, a uh, little by little, day by day, you know, more bad, less morale. Um... Basically, just the worst possible conditions under which you can try to maintain an organized fighting force, uh, those were present. And again, I say, uh, foobar. Um, uh, anyway, the Communist Party was pretty much nowhere to be found at this point. Uh, Liebknecht and uh, Luxembourg's assassinations did a lot to uh, demoralize the movement. Uh, they even contributed to uh, Mering's uh, death not too long after that. It po- piled a lot of stress on the man. He was already ailing. Uh, and uh, it just, 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 just too much to bear and uh, just, just died. Um, uh, Kniv uh, wasn't too uh, good of a... Uh, he wasn't in good, good shape either. Uh, he, uh, he, he died in bed from consumption. Uh, this 
It's like the saddest end credits ever. Um, Raddick was arrested. Uh, he was uh, kept in, a, in somewhat more favorable conditions than most other political prisoners because they felt they could use him to uh, help create lines of communication with uh, Russia again. Uh, it took the whole police force to find him, though, because uh, he was a fucking champ. ACAP. <laughs> uh, uh, uh tried to regroup, reorganize, and possibly stage another insurrection. However, it didn't work out too terribly well. And uh, he had to go on the run for a smidge. Uh, anyway, he was located and uh, shot because, once again, ACAB. Um, Eugene Levin, uh, uh, the <laughs> poor bastard. I keep forgetting I put that on there in the margin. Um, managed to avoid the massacre of the Vervitz uh, defenders, uh, and was, but they, but he was sent to Bavaria. And ended up getting collared, tried, and shot anyway. Um, uh, the whole deal was absolutely unrecognizably and indescribably screwed. Uh, there was no organization, centralized or otherwise, only small groups and individuals against uh, the uh, Free Corps. And, and uh, the, to denounce uh, the, the, de denouncing uh, the majority party and trade union leaders because they were working in tandem with them to some to, to multiple degrees and it was just it was just shit, it was all shit. Uh, the particularly the 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 second week of uh, January in 1919 onward, it's not exactly an effective demonstration of revolutionary efficacy. Um, I say that now, looking back, like hindsight is 2020, but. Uh, they were doing their best. They were trying hard. Uh, a lot of half-hearted sucker punches with not much follow-through, though, uh, uh, contributed to uh, a lot of a lot of problems. Uh, more determined enemy in the police than initially expected uh, led to a lot of bad outcomes. On the ninth, a revolutionary demonstration was broken up by the police. The next day, a bigger demonstration was fired upon by them, and fifteen were killed. Two days later, uh, KPDS activities were banned. They were now illegal. Your opinion is now illegal. Um, the tenth really sucked. Uh, uh, in Stuttgart, an armed uh, an armed demonstration happened, uh, occupied a new Tageblatt, and uh, produced demands. Uh, let me see. Did I already flip that card? I can't remember. I did. Okay. Uh, then this uh, RoboCop ass dude, Lieutenant Han, uh, had all the leaders arrested for a conspiracy, a cab, um, again, in uh, Duisburg, uh, a, a communist called uh, what's that? Rog, I think, approved and authorized seizure of a sock dim paper. Turns out his comrades were fucking liberals and yeeted him. Um, in Hamburg, revolutionaries sacked the Hamburg Echo. Fucking legends. Uh, the next day, the left went about business as usual by viciously infighting until nothing worked anymore. Um, on the 12th, the army did what they do and practiced area denial by recapturing uh, the barracks in Halle. And on the 16th, they arrested... Uh, uh, how do, you, how do you say his name? Uh, the M one, Messeberg. Uh, how do you spell it? M e s e b e r g. Messeberg, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm not. Well, I don't no. speak German. I just I kind of wing it with a lot of these. Um, Messeberg. Okay, <laughs> we'll work with that. Uh, but who was uh, immediately sprung the next day by the Red Guard by means of machine gun threatening. Uh, communists, uh, ironically, took control of the police. Um, then they made contact with more revolutionary elements, uh, elements in uh, uh, Leipzig and Hamburg. Meanwhile, uh, the Ruhr miners threatened to strike if the Free Corps attacked Bremen. Anyway, they did it, and the city uh, they took the city in less than 48 hours. Uh, it looked like uh, Ruhr and Bremen... We're going to uh, do some cool shit together for a bit, uh, but uh, you know how that goes. Anyway, 
On the 11th, shit got uh, real in Essen, and uh, the Workers and Soldiers Council took control of the Employers uh, Council's premises. Uh, they were going to do the thing. And on the 13th, a regional conference approved the initiative of the Soldier and Worker Council and moved to socialize the vines. On the 19th, uh, NOSCA was uh, approved to provisionally organize the army and was made Minister of War. Oh, dear. Uh, see counter-revolutionary shenanigans to learn more about this situation. Okay, that was real helpful, me. Um, but yes. Uh, anyway, capitalists did the gross shit that they usually do and paid the army to yoink back the mines. Uh, the councils were arrested and new ones were elected in a similar fashion to a CIA coup. Good God. Um, predictably, bullshit followed and workers suffered. On February the 24th, a uh, general strike broke out in uh, central Germany and it was nearly uh, a total in Halle. Uh, and the next day, spread to Saxony. On the 26th, Stockdoms did uh, cop shit uh, and uh, counter strike Nobody liked that. Anyway, the army deployed with predictable results. They were overrun. An officer was identified and lynched for being a spy the very next day. Another strike was being planned in, uh, in Berlin in solidarity, but Stockdoms shut that down and... Stockdoms trying to prevent workers from organizing. Nobody liked that either. They did it anyway, and that's where I uh, ran out of time uh, going over my notes. So. That's all right. That's a very good summary of chapter uh, 13 there. <laughs> like we said, folks, like we're not covering, like we're, we're, very much like the, this book is 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 so big and so dense, and we are uh, we're uh, <laughs> professional amateurs here um, hacking at it. <laughs> I do believe it is it is thick enough that if I owned a physical copy, I could probably utilize it in a home defense situation. Yeah, like effectively. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Kyle is actually. I wish he was here for a number of reasons, but. Not the least of which is that I always ask him to show off the uh, the physical copy of the book that he has um, because it is the thickest of thick boys. Um, it's a it's a big book and it's got an absolutely gorgeous cover. Um, and the three of us who are live here uh, actually just have the PDF, which I just posted a link to in the chat. Please don't demonetize me, YouTube. <laughs> Actually, I'm not even monetized, so what am I talking about? Don't, don't, <laughs> don't eat me. Yeah, no, I, I'm probably never going to monetize this channel, because I feel like that would kind of, I don't know, it'd be, I feel like it would be kind of distasteful. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, keep, keep my shit free of advertising. I hate seeing ads on other people's stuff, so, you know, uh, mm -hmm. no sponsored content either, none of that garbage. Um you know, fortunate to have. Uh, th this video is brought to you by uh, Skillshare, just by the way. <laughs> for uh, for all of you out there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we've got we've got one more chapter to get through here, folks. Um, um so let's. Uh, Simba uh, has our 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 closing chapter for the day. So we're gonna finish our summary and then we're gonna use our uh, remaining time for uh, discussion. So. Uh, I think uh, the 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 long uh, maybe for folks who are just tuning in the uh, if you take nothing else away from today's uh, uh, discussion it's uh, Bernie killed Rosa. <laughs> Bernie killed Rosa. <laughs> if you take nothing else away, it's uh, so social democrats do cop shit and Bernie killed Rosa and made himself the Kaiser basically. Pretty much. <laughs> Um, yeah, so <laughs> Simba is gonna, um, take us home today with the, the last chapter, so, uh, I'm gonna give them the, the mic now. Alright, so, um, thankfully the, uh, last chapter is, is probably the shortest chapter, and if you're confused about the chain of events, that's okay, we kind of are too. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Definitely. Like definitely the order that things happen 
like not none of the last two chapters or neither of the two chapters are completely chronological so like yeah actually yeah, and after simba after you give your summary i'm actually going to use my uh, screen cap to show um the timeline that's at the end of the book so that's um, an ooh. amazing fantastic idea yeah <laughs> yeah i approve of that completely um and you guys will be able oh, to see it too yay okay awesome um anyway uh yeah so we're at 1919 which um the the chapter that i'm covering chapter uh 14 basically starts with the the uh, founding of the third international with uh, Zin Zinoviev uh, for right now as the leader. Uh, Zinoviev is a just like a regular Moscow Soviet dude who um, he made it high up into I don't think he made it into the Central Committee. He was commissar of something under Stalin. but uh, as of the current moment he's uh, the leader of the third international. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg actually thought that, the uh, a new international was necessary, uh, historically necessarily necessary, but like not yet, uh, because there would have to be many more Western European um, communist parties that were much more organized than they were. And at this point in time, uh, you have to remember that, like, aside from Russia, Germany is kind of seen as the heart of the revolution. So they want that to have like the strongest uh you know, communist movement, especially among the people, which uh, both Trotsky and Radek make points about that. Yes, there would have to be a revolution. It just couldn't happen yet because there wasn't enough support for like through and through communists, uh, because we have to remember that even the people in the government that were arresting the communists, like call themselves socialists. Um, so th there wasn't enough of a following for people who were thoroughly defined by like m not revisionist Marxist uh, philosophy. And uh, Radek actually makes an interesting uh, comparison to the Russian Revolution. He thinks that German socialism was weighed down by reformism because of uh, the economic crisis that happened after uh, World War I. Uh, and Ger he says that German workers often took the side of the bourgeoisie and formed the basis of the counter-revolution because of how wildly dispersed the German socialists were. Um, because pretty much everybody at the time, or not everybody at the time, but socialism is very popular, and because there were so many splits and breaks and uh, different versions of the communist or social democratic movement at the time, uh, he says that reformism brought something more to the table uh, or something attractive enough that the counter-revolution could overcome like the revolution revolution. Um, and he definitely thinks that revolution is possible and necessary, but with big money in the way and people siding with the bourgeoisie and the reformists, um, it's just gonna take way, way longer and be much more devastating than it was in Russia. Uh, Trotsky thought that the international would be founded in Moscow as it was, but then eventually Germany or England or, um, I think he said France would have a revolution and then they would move it there. Uh, because at this point, Trotsky thinks that um, not only is Germany or would England maybe be or France maybe be like, would those places be like good, like ripe for revolution at the time, but also they would be the very best place, like the most industrialized, most economically forward countries are always the best ones to have uh, a communist movement. Unfortunately, he, he was a little bit too optimistic, but he didn't have the same foresight that we do, or hindsight that we do. Uh, and then in the first six months of 1919, uh, the Weimar Republic is formed. Uh, they maintain the Freikorps. That thing is still around. They kind of have, from the perspective of the social democratic government, they have to keep the Freikorps around uh, because they just had a revolution. There are p political dissidents like all over the fucking place. Uh, you, you kind of have to like keep that shit locked down in a way. Uh, and Germany is finally a unitary state with decentralized regional governments. Uh, once again, Brue uses the word decentralized kind of loosely because to, to maintain order after a revolution, obviously you're going to have to express more authority, but at least on paper, 
in the Constitution, uh, the unitary government is kind of decentralized. Uh, and they, but they do like nationalize a couple of key industries and give people basic uh, liber liberal pr uh, freedoms, which there are unfortunately exceptions to. Um, in a sec. For example, yeah, you can have freedom of press and freedom of assembly, except for if you're a revolutionary communist. Like, that's not cool. And uh, Nosk, I think in chapter 13, or maybe it was actually in 14, remembers uh, in, in his memoir, Brue cites his memoir, and he says, like, yeah, I remember the first elections, uh, there were, like, dudes with machine guns guarding it. <laughs> um, so if that shows you, like, how, how free it is, like, there you go. But they did have universal suffrage, finally. So that, that is a good thing. In the Constitution, the power of the presidency was gigantic. Uh, for those who are maybe not familiar, um, so in Germany or any parliamentary state, practically, uh, you don't vote for a candidate, you vote for a party, and then that party goes to uh, the legislative group, which is generally there are two branches of the or a bicameral legislature, but that's not important. You vote for the party that you want to represent you, and then those representatives vote for the executive. So they would be voting for uh, the president and the chancellor, or sorry, the president. They would be voting for the president, and then the president appoints the chancellor. Um, but they do have to get approval. Um, but basically, the uh, presidency, in the words of Brue, was just the updated, liberalized version of the Kaiser. Uh, the presidency was gigantically powerful. They could demand a referendum on any, any legislation that passed that they didn't think should have. Uh, Article 48 basically granted the president dictatorship powers uh, close to those of the Kaiser in, in a situation that was like an emergency. Uh, the presidency could express judicial powers by setting up special courts, and the uh, presidency could dissolve dissolve the Reichstag, which is basically like if the presidency was the president, like Donald Trump right now, uh, would say like, hey, uh, so Congress, you're fired. <laughs> All of you are just gone uh, in the case of an emergency, quote unquote. And... Um, all of the democratic kind of liberal provisions came second to the power of the presidency. And uh, this is a quote directly from the book. Thus, the activities of Nosk's Free Corps, the uh, Freikorps, the repression of Berlin in March, and later the um, installation of the dictatorship of Hitler all took place within the framework of the Constitution, which its defenders, uh, defenders uh, presented at the time as the most democratic constitution in the world. Uh, so, so that tells you like how how far liberals are w willing to stretch their idea or definition of freedom. Like there you go. Uh, there's a, a bit of ideology in my summary, but what what good summary doesn't have a little bit of ideology in it? Right, right. We are always eating from the trash bin all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Already, yeah. And so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, uh, Ebert was elected uh, president with Scheidemann as chancellor. The SPD won the majority with most of their right wing in uh, leadership roles, which is kind of a theme of the last few years. There was always like a lot of nominally left wing groups that had right like their right wing at the forefront of the leadership. And uh, the extreme right wing was supported by big money, much of which is around today. Corporations like Siemens that are government contractors currently making missiles or Deutsche Bank, which is the um, fifth richest bank in the world. Uh, they had a huge uh, influence on political culture after the, um, I guess, the uprising, uprising of November in 1918. Uh, and they were like freely able to distribute any kind of political propaganda that they wanted uh, practically. Uh, the Bolsheviks also considered the German Revolution was only really postponed. It would happen eventually, but it might be in a, a much more nonlinear uh, fashion than they uh, expected. And uh, many tried to make the comparison with the Russian, Russian Revolution, kind of. Uh, Trotsky kind of rejected this, saying that the real culprit of the failure of, or not failure, but the setback of the revolution was um, 
the prevalence of social democracy and uh, revisionism. This chapter is actually the the most dense with uh, the fragrance of of uh, Trotskyism, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's on the wind. Quote. Yeah, it's it's on the wind. There you go. But yeah, I mean that's the chapter, short and sweet. Yeah. Well, we made it through our entire summary. Good job, comrades. Uh, I would like to just take a moment to uh, welcome the folks who are just joining us now. Uh, we've got about uh, eleven people watching at the time oh. of uh, right uh, at the moment. Um, so I would just like to invite those of you who are uh, listening in to uh, make any comments or questions that you have that came up during our summary. Um, we welcome, this is like, we, we tr intended to, um, you know, make these streams like a, like a live study group that you can participate in, right? Like this is, we're not a bunch of, uh, you know, professors handing down, um, you know, uh, expert information here. We're um, reading a book and talking about it with you. Um, and so we're here to facilitate any of that, to ex facilitate any questions you have. We don't necessarily have all the answers, but they can sometimes provoke a, a really interesting discussion or, um, you know, make us, uh, you know, think more deeply about the situation or go look up facts that we maybe missed. So that sort of thing. So just taking a moment to welcome all of you to our stream and um, to make sure that you feel empowered to uh, engage with us directly. That's the whole point of doing these live is so that you can be here and uh, ask your questions and make your comments and so on and so on. So, um, but we generally reserve kind of the later part uh, after we um, finish summarizing what we read uh, we spend the remaining time uh, just uh, having kind of a free-form discussion where we talk about, you know, anything that's, like, kind of stuck out to us during the reading or, like, how we think, um, you know, what we read kind of applies to the contemporary situation that the socialist uh, movement is facing today. Um, you know, bear in mind that's probably, you know, going to be a bit U.S.-centric because that's where... Uh, Three of uh, the three of us uh, live, but uh, um, you know, it's not to to uh, certainly not to 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 um, exclude any discussion of what what's going on in uh, the world outside of the U.S. It's just uh, probably going to be the main anchor point for for discussion. So just bear that in mind. Um, so I just kind of uh, wanted to get my co-hosts' uh, initial thoughts on. Uh, you know, we just unpacked a lot of, of, of just really heavy shit. So, um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to kind of do like a, a quick, you know, round past the uh, past the baton around and uh, have everyone kind of give their, um, you know, thoughts. It, you know, it doesn't need to be super well formulated if you just have kind of things that came up in the course of our summary here um, or in the course of our kind of intermittent discussion. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll shut up and uh, let my co-hosts uh, say their piece. In whatever order you think is, is most appropriate. <laughs> Sorry mm -hmm. for overflowing your revolution, Uwu. Ebert. <laughs> <laughs> I just I want that on my in in my obituary. Please, somebody just say that I like that's that's my achievement coming up with that like that as a thing. In any in any case, um, I think that it's it's actually um really interesting that um the revolutionary spirit is so strong at this point that people are still being optimistic about uh a potential successful uh communist revolution in germany um because like like i think that people who uh called out the difference between the russian revolution and the german revolution were correct i i think that at this point it didn't seem like a uh communist revolution was 
possible, but I mean, if these people didn't believe it was possible, we wouldn't be reading about it because they would have given up. You know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, with actually, actually, you know what? After um, the deaths of Luxembourg, Lieb Liebknecht, and uh, Mehring, who's, who's left? Who are the main leaders of the uh, communist movement in Germany? Yeah, I mean, that's the difficulty of this is that, I mean, what happens in, in January, like, slaughters not only, like, the two big, the big cheeses, you know, Lieb Liebknecht and, and Rosa, but, like, who else dies? Uh, Leo Jogicis dies. Uh, Franz mm -hmm. Mehring dies. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think Dorenbach is still kicking. Um, mm -hmm. But just so many of the like, not just not just leaders, but like th like the top leaders. This would be like if, in Russia. It would be like if like Lenin, Stalin, and Kamenev, and like all the top Bolshevik leadership just like like just got offed by the Okhrana one night, you know, yeah. I mean, like speaking of which it's kind of nothing shy of a miracle that that never happened. Like, <laughs> true. <laughs> true, true. I mean, I, I would call it a miracle personally. I mean, if I believed in, in things such as miracles, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I think that I, this is kind of like taking a step back from the particular events of uh, the German Revolution. But if I were like just a person or if I was a, uh, I don't know, if I was maybe even a, um, a veteran of World War One or something, uh, kind of just like looking at the sorts of events going on at the time, I think it would be kind of easy to to be like, huh, it seems like the communists have like a really good idea, but within one country, you can't really uh, solve the contradictions between wage labor and capital. And but at like the very least, you might be able to like unite as a nation, which like maybe that would give birth to some kind of like German nationalism, which at this point I don't think exists really, right? German nationalism. Yeah, German nationalism. I mean, like, like actually, I, I, I think that that's one of the central contradictions here is okay. precisely, I mean, like, I think there's definitely kind of, like, that's melted a bit during, you know, because everyone is pissed about the war. But, like, at the same mm -hmm. time, it's like, um, you know, like, clearly you still have, like, a very loyal core of, you know, officers and, and army people who are, like, more than willing to go, you know, come home and slaughter any revolutionary and not just, not just revolutionaries, but like these are, you know, as we said, like, you know, they're using troops to, and to, to shell, uh, their own newspaper outlet. Like Forverts, right. Forverts was, was not the revolutionaries newspaper. It was, the SPD's newspaper and the revolutionaries and the workers were just occupying the headquarters. It really is telling like how far the SPD government, the social democratic government was willing to go. They would literally bomb their own newspaper headquarters just to undermine the resistance. Yeah. At one point, I think uh, in chapter three, Bruet like talks about like the discrepancy between the reported and uh, potential like civilian deaths and like the reported like deaths are like one thousand two hundred or something of innocent civilians, but like the communists say like no, it's actually like something like three thousand or so if I if I remember correctly, um, and I like if I were in the SPD, I guess like. Or at least that kind of a discrepancy points to some kind of motivation to like be like, ah, no, that didn't happen, you know, because they, they will go like super, super far. But don't it seems like they want to act like they're being reasonable about that whole thing um, when they're very clearly not. Um, in any case, like after after um, all of the 
like governments of Europe declare war on each other in World War One, and you just come back from a war, and like it's January, the the leadership of Germany, uh, the Germany German um, communist movement is dead. Like it seems like it would probably be pretty easy to be like, oh well, nationalism it is, like to me at least. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, and I mean, like, I think we're starting to see, like, those things that are, like, going to, like, t start taking shape in the course of, like, you know, Nazism becoming a thing. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're still, you know, years, like, a decade plus out from that at this point, but it's kind of... Um, you can start to see kind of the, the early contours of this starting to take shape, right? Like the SPD right. is clearly treacherous as hell and people hate them. Mm -hmm. um, the KPD and just like the radicals more generally are like, like, you know, maybe they've got their hearts in the right place, but they're scattered and disunited and like kind of like, <sighs> It's easy for us to say, like, oh, they kind of have their heads up their asses, but, like, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it's not like it was easy to figure out what to do, right? Like, I, I, I don't want to just, like, say, like, well, they couldn't have done anything differently, but, like, at the same time, you know, it's, 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 it, I feel like, you know, I keep saying this in our discussions, like, it's easy for us to just be like, oh, well, they should have done X, Y, and Z, where it's like, right. you know, <laughs> like, um, Anyhow, like, I also, uh, we can get this, get to this later if we want. Um, one thing, one, some of the feedback that I got from, uh, our, um, folks who are, you know, uh, watching and participating here is the, uh, that they wanted to hear about more, uh, kind of documents from the time. And mm -hmm. so I actually printed out, um, Karl Radek's uh, eulogy of Karl Liebknecht, um, which, if we want, uh, I don't want to derail this discussion right now, but I can read uh, parts of it later if uh, folks are interested in that. Just um, you know, let us know in the chat if that's what you want. So, um, yeah, Izzy, do you um, want to follow up the discussion here? Or? I think that one thing that I have taken away from this particular section of this book is that for um, the, that an essential part of any revolutionary's uh, toolkit, even if they plan to, even if they don't really, really plan on participating in armed conflict, is to at least have a basic comprehension of uh, uh, guerrilla tactics and battlefield tactics. Just so if it comes to that, they would be able to like do basic evasion and escape or uh, engage uh, on the fly like it's it's just something that maybe maybe someone would want to brush up on because holy shit <laughs> yeah yeah i mean uh at one point wasn't ownership of a gun like enough to get you shot by the police yeah at some mm -hmm. point i mean they basically declare martial law and yeah like uh, they said, okay, for, the first thing was, okay, if you have, if you have a gun on your person, we can shoot you on the spot. Uh, mm -hmm. and then after that wasn't, uh, killing enough people. So they thought, um, they were like, okay, if you have a gun in your house, we can shoot you on right, the spot, right. which is like, yeah, wow. Um, but I think, yeah, like. I think maybe I kind of I, um, I kind of trailed off making my point about kind of the early the kind of the early sketch of Nazism taking shape here, which is yeah, this yeah. like nationalism. Like this is where like this this humiliating defeat in World War One, and these soldiers are coming home to total ruin, and like there's this very real sense I think of wounded national pride right like especially in the more like kind of reactionary sections of workers we talked earlier about you know what uh the influence of things like the labor aristocracy and we can get get into that more than this discussion if you would like to but um like it's you know just the the absolute bankruptcy of social democracy and um uh, and the kind of like like 
I guess, <laughs> incompetence, for lack of a better word, of, of the radicals is like, you know, well, if the masses can't turn to the Soak Dems for leadership and they can't turn to the communists for leadership uh, and the kind of the military, uh, you know, this uh, order is kind of the only thing that's holding things together, I think it's easy to not again not to excuse what's what's going to come but like kind of helps frame that of like okay like here's this you know the law and order is coming in to quell all this silly socialist infighting and blah 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 these people are all you know either tre treacherous um you know losers or kind of incompetent uh leaders on either end so it's like if, if that's what's there, if, if there's this kind of militarized, nationalistic um, thing taking shape, then it's, like, frankly, kind of understandable, like, not excusable, to, please don't take my, me wrong there, but, like, it, it, it's, we can kind of um, frame it a little bit better and make, make more sense out of how something like, not, uh, you know, German Nazism could kind of take shape in that environment. I think that's that's pretty much the comment I wanted to make about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of an aside, but speaking of Nazis, isn't um, isn't Carl Schmidt mentioned somewhere in chapter uh, twelve or thirteen? I don't recall offhand. Okay. Um, but I did. I was just reminded by Atomic Source that, um. I was going to share the timeline. So okay, as yeah, uh, yeah. Atomic Source just pointed out, you can get the, uh, um, yeah, I can pull up, uh, it's on, there's a timeline of it on Marxist.org. Um, I'm actually going to just pull up my, uh, the end of my, of the book here on my end. I'm going to skip to the end because that's where the, Earlier, Atomic Source said they found the ebook versions of uh, this book on libcom.org. So. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it's there. Yeah. Um, I actually posted a link to it in the chat earlier. Um, so please don't, don't, please don't report me. <laughs> don't report me for copyright crimes. Uh, I'm very nice. Uh, nicest tanky you know, probably. <laughs> That's, you know, like... I've seen anarchists who are like the most anarchity like type people be called tankies, and it's just uh, mind blowing. I think these words, tankies. like especially yeah. online, really don't mean much. Um, they really don't. <laughs> like, I get called tanky like five times a day. It is. Yeah, like I, like uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been called like a uh, right deviationist or like some other <laughs> nonsense. It's like. <laughs> You know, Amazing. so, but, okay, so my favorite, my favorite, uh, words that mean nothing are, uh, Radlib, um, mm -hmm. Woke Scold, and, oh, that's uh, one. what's yeah. the other one? It's pretty much all the terms that, like, the Chapo crowd uses. Oh, I hate, man. I gotta hate them so much. Um, oh, anyway. God, what was the other one? Uh, Woke Scold. There's one that goes with Woke Scold that I'm trying to remember. Uh, ah, it's fucking funny like, too. Like fucking because... Ben Shapiro literally came up with the term woke scold, and the fact yeah. that uh, you have you see like self avowed leftists unironically repeating it is just so goofy. But like, they're also like genuinely serious people who are making definitely making a positive change, like Vosh, uh, who used the. <laughs> uh, you guys don't know Vosh. I. I have my own opinions <laughs> here, right. which um, I, oh gosh, I don't. I'm, I'm anti Vosh gang. Yeah, no, <laughs> so, me too. Like, like I just, like, <laughs> yeah. I don't think but, we can but really get into that right like, now, but. Like, oh yeah, cool. Yeah, as much as it, as it, uh, I'd love to trash some uh, dirtbag leftists on here. I think we're going to be probably doing plenty of that more on the abstract theoretical level anyhow. And I think our, uh. Our audience is clever enough to put the pieces together and figure out who we're talking about anyway. So, 
Yes. Uh, uh, all right. Let's uh, let's get to the. Um... Yeah. Here's the timeline. I have it pulled up on my computer. So. Um, Beautiful. So we've got four columns here. Uh, we've got this column here is. Um, oh gosh, I have to pull it up on my bed too because I have this mass. I printed this out. Oh, that's a actually a really good question. I, what? Sorry, what? Atomic Source says, do you guys think that you can't work with sock dims ever because of the lessons learned from the German Rev? That's um, a really good question. Yeah. I Depends on what you mean by work with. Yeah, that's a real... That's, that, that is a uh, definition uh, that needs to be uh, uh, codified. Yeah, with a quick I mean... I'll, <laughs> Like it obviously you don't mean like oh if you're at work with a sock dem and you want to unionize would you unionize with a stock dem like because of, of course, course you would but I mean how far could that cooperation go and so um yeah I think that's the more interesting question uh in in serious organizing like how far could you go with organizing with a uh, sock dem who is really fighting a very different fight than you. Yeah. And really, at this point nowadays, it really depends on the individual sock dem. Right. And I mean, I think especially, and we're going to keep kind of hitting on this in our discussions, is that in the United States, there's really, like, those labels have so little meaning in the mm -hmm. sense that, like, there is no big social democratic organization. Like, there's the, like, D there's the DSA, but, like, the DSA itself is so, like politically heterogeneous like you've got everyone from like yeah. left liberals to like trotskyites and marxist leninists and maoists and anarchists like it's yeah. kind of hard to say like oh this organization is sock dem this organization is ml this organization is maoist and so on and so on right, mm -hmm. right. so it's like it's really hard in the states i think because the state of the socialist movement broadly speaking is so um, kind of disconnected. Yeah, it's I disconnected mean, when... and it's very primordial. Like it's in this very like we are re giving birth to a socialist movement after basically five decades of having no socialist movement whatsoever. So I think that those definitions of like this is a sock dem, this is an ML, etc. Like those definitions don't really hold water at the moment. I'm not saying they never will. It's just like you can kind of start see things starting to kind of take shape around certain issues. Right. And like we have, we've alluded to that before with like, you know, with regard to like the so-called dirtbag left and like so on, but like, you know, it, 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 these things are all, I think we have to, as at least for me as a Marxist, like thinking about these things requires us to be applying historically specific analysis to a historically specific situation. Right. We can't just like, you know, go copying, you know, transhistorically thinking about, well, the Sockdoms and the communists in Germany did this and that a hundred years ago, so therefore it's always going to be the same now. Like, that's not how we look at history. As Marxists, you know, that's not how we look at history. History is, all a, de is a determinant process, right? There's all kinds of, you know, geographically, culturally, et cetera, specific features of a, of, of a, you know, of a social landscape at a given time that gives shape to what its movements are going to look like. And we just don't have, you know, you have to look at it from, you know, a scientific perspective. We just don't have enough data right now. We haven't collected enough data because our, our movement is, is young. Our, and that's good. Like, it's good. We have a movement that's young, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of really nail these things down until they've taken a little bit more body on. And I think we're, like frankly, I think we're at least like a decade out from that. Like I could be, yeah. proved, I could easily be proven wrong, but you know, like yeah. anyway. So I want to just love your chat, Mel. Oh, fuck... gee. <laughs> so again, socialism in America. Oh no, evangelical communism. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, um, so I just wanted to say real quick for the folks who wanted to hear about the timeline. So here, uh, the far left column here is uh, the world events. So there's, I think, five columns here. So the far left column, which I've got my mouse hovering over right now, is the world events column. 
the second column over, which I've now got my mouse on, is uh, events specifically in Germany. The third column over, which I've now got my mouse hovering on, is um, events specifically within the revolutionary left in Germany. Um, and then the fourth column is the international revolutionary movement. And then the far right column is the uh, happenings in revolutionary Russia. So this, uh, where our, um, where we're at right now in, on the timeline is November of 1918. So that's, um, there's the, the, the Kiel Sailors Mutiny on the 3rd. Uh, the fifth through ninth, there's a revolutionary wave. Workers and sailor, soldier, uh, workers and soldiers council set up, um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can see it on the screen, hopefully, pretty well. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm going to just kind of scroll down to where we were, where we kind of pick things up in our stream today, which is basically um, kind of the end of December. So. There's the uh, armed clashes on kind of the pe period preceding Christmas, um, Christmas uh, demonstration, workers' demonstrations, uh, the occupation of the Forwärts bu uh, building, uh, and then on the 29th of December, the USPD minister has resigned. Um, folks in the chat, let, let us know if you can see our, uh, uh, our timeline okay or if I need to zoom in. I'm actually, I think I'm going to zoom in so you guys can see a little bit better. Yeah, because I'm watching the stream on my phone right now, and you can see it just fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I am going to zoom in just a little bit, though. Sure. Oh, too much. Too much? There we go. Okay, uh, so January. Uh, January 18th, opening of the Peace Conference. That's the, you know, drawing the, the World War One to a close. Um, January 4th, removal of Icorn from the uh, police uh, chief spot. Um, 15th murder of Liebknecht and Luxembourg, uh, February free, uh, free Corps begin to cover the country, Radix arrested on the 12th, um, let's see, next page, oh, well, that, then we're getting into March, and so we haven't quite gotten there yet, so, I hope that that's, uh, clarifying for folks watching, so I'm gonna switch back over to, uh, to my co-hosts here now. Um, folks in the chat, uh, reminding you to, um, you know, please keep, keep talking to us and keep asking questions that are coming up for you and so on. And, um, my lovely co-hosts. Like yeah, please. What, what's up? Yeah. I'd like to make a comment. So, uh, atomic source says there also wasn't much the revolutionaries could do given they were so few in number. And I think that that's, uh, a really easy point to make about this kind of situation, uh, but I can't help but comment on the fact that if the revolutionaries were so few in number, then that has to have mean uh, that has to mean that they didn't do something correctly before uh, this sort of critical juncture, um, being from November of 1918 onward to like March of 1919. Um, I'll be right back, would, guys. Sorry. <laughs> which would be that they didn't get like enough mass support like they um that would mean that um the uh common whatever communist movement exi that existed uh didn't build itself up um enough that like the mass of people wanted to defend uh whatever gains the communists had made uh up until that point and i don't necessarily think that's true um i think that they did like there were enough revolutionaries, they were just dispersed among a couple of different factions that had critical differences that that resulted in um, a whole lot of confusion about who's who stood for what, and um, there was a lot of strike breaking and counter strike breaking, and all of a sudden, oh shit, I can't have a gun, you know, and like why is the SPD bombing their own building? Uh, I. I think that there was also like a revolution in Hungary that was like semi successful, but then some Hungarians had to either no, actually Germans had to retreat into Hungary. But um I, I think that it wasn't necessarily the number of 
active revolutionaries, like as far as the vanguard is concerned, it's more so that those uh, the vanguard uh, being like the communist movement was not united. Like there wasn't anything tying them all together. So if you're tying these groups, mm-hmm. yes, Atomic Source. I absolutely agree that it's hard to relate and argue with and convince a decent amount of uh, people. If you're a tiny, loose grouping of, of people yourself. Um, and in this case, it was a couple of groupings of loosely knit people. Like, it was a couple of different uh, communist parties or movements that were happening at the same time that, the ha- that had their own, like, vanguards. Agree? Disagree, Izzy? Thoughts? I, uh, no. Well, that's pretty, pretty, pretty on point, actually. I thought I'd actually take a sec to clarify this term uh, vanguard, which gets thrown around a lot. And um, like, I think it's really worth kind of exploring just um, on a theoretical level because vanguard, vanguard definitely like, especially among uh, kind of my impression is that among anarchists, the term vanguard is very uh, bad, but like, so let's, uh, I want to just kind of zoom out here for a second and deal with general definitions first. So a vanguard in military terms exclusively is just like your front units. It's literally like your advanced guard, your uh, best troops that are on the front line, you know, from first to arrive, last to leave, that kind of thing. The best, the best and brightest, your, you know, your strongest, toughest, best shooting troops you got. Um, That's the vanguard in the military sense of the word. So a vanguard in the sense that we mean as when we're talking about like class analysis, the vanguard of say like the proletariat would be like your best, you know, rootin' tootinists, hardcore wobblies and best, you know, um, union activists and Black Lives Matter activists and your best, you know, uh, this, that, and the other thing. They're, they exist already. Like, those those people exist. They're out there. Just because you have a vanguard doesn't necessarily mean that it is a, a cohered, organized force. That is the idea in uh, Leninist theory behind uh, a vanguard party. The idea is that you know, you constitute yourself as a vanguard organization. You are not just like some people who get together and call yourselves the vanguard. Like you actually are constituted out of like these, you know, the best and most militant um, section of the working class. And like, that's very much what the Bolsheviks did in, in the revolutionary period leading up to 1917. Um, And that's, what a lot of other, um, you know, movements since then have, uh, you know, specifically Leninist movements have tried to imitate or or copy in in whatever way that they can. Now that's not always easy, and fre- frequently, you know, uh, there are people, you know, there are groups that go around, you know, uh, calling themselves the vanguard where they're really not the vanguard of anything, like. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, just because you call yourself the vanguard doesn't mean you're the vanguard. Yeah. It's right. like I also think. <laughs> uh, I also think that um, a lot of people get um, kind of confused about the relationship between the party and the people, like the vanguard mm-hmm. party and the people. Yeah, um, party and, and class. Yeah, it might. Yeah, yeah, it might surprise some people to know that the Black Panthers called themselves the vanguard of the revolution against the U.S. government. Um, they were right. He, <laughs> they were right. No, absolutely, they were absolutely right. That. Um, but but uh, the Vanguard Party does does not exist, and and like it doesn't it doesn't just like come into being, and all of a sudden there are these people who command people to do other thing, to do like whatever they want, and have a military with a very strict hierarchy that isn't accountable to the people. Like no, uh, the whatever Vanguard Party that exists in uh, within the. Uh, worldview of, of Marxism, Leninism, and or Maoism, Gonzalo thought, hashtag Gonzalo. Uh, <laughs> we don't uh, need to stir the pot here. <laughs> we don't need to stir the pot, yeah. But in Marxism, Leninism, uh, you have to 
provide things to the people. Uh, and that like necessarily means that like at one point you have to just be a loosely knit group of people who organizes tenants unions. You know, like if you wanted to join the, the uh, Black Panther Party, you had to read a bunch of books. You had to uh, abstain from all drugs and limit your alcohol consumption. You had to like do this or that and participate in community events and give out a certain amount of food and you had to be accountable to like certain people. And yes, there is necessarily a hierarchy. Um, but the reason that people would follow a party is because they would provide them with something, either opportunities to unionize or uh, in some cases, some very desperate cases, they would provide food. Uh, in the case of the the um, the um, SPD in its earlier days, and you know later the Spartacus League and all that stuff, uh, they were providing support to unions, and they were like actively unionizing people. They were telling them when to strike, when not to strike, because uh, because. The people involved with the party or the people who were sympathetic to the party understood that they had something to gain by following uh, either following the orders or, you know, being playing nice with uh, the Vanguard party. Is right. And I mean, like they were like at that in the early stages, especially um, they were very organically connected to the working class. And I mean, that's right. that is the, the biggest necessity of a, of a Vanguard party of any kind um which is is that organic connection of the working class um because right. you can't just like you can't just conjure this out of the ground and this like all goes back and maybe maybe we're really getting into theoretical weeds here but i think it's good which is this all kind of um goes back to uh lenin's what is to be done right like this is what it means to have like an or like you have to have in Leninist conception, like the leadership has to come organically from the working class to like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, cause it's like in Lenin's words and what is to be done, it's like, you can't just, you know, pray that the economic contradictions of capitalism are just going to magically give rise to socialist consciousness. You have to organize a tight nucleus of ideologically trained people to be like, this is what socialism is. This is how we're going to get there. And, you know, and not just that, not just we're the smart people listen to us about what we have to say about socialism, but Hey, also we are in the trenches fighting alongside you. You know, this is mm -hmm. where we're coming from. This is, that's, that is Leninism at its core. And I feel like, you know, maybe <laughs> like, I think these are good discussions to have, and maybe like mm. we can have another stream where we just talk about Lenin because I want that. But, <laughs> um, but like, yeah, I think like this, the period that we're discussing today in Germany, like, really lays bare like how if you don't have, you know, not just like a tight nucleus of of well trained. Um, revolutionaries to lead the struggle like you know uh, when shit hits the fan things are going to be infinitely harder right mm -hmm. and you know so like there's of course there are you know other perspectives on this and like you know uh, you know anarchists obviously have um, have certain uh, theoretical uh, beefs with that because of um I mean, frankly, a few of the reasons that I'm not really qualified to elaborate on, but, um, mm. uh, Izzy, if you'd like to comment on that, like we're not an ideologically homogenous group here. So, um, right, right. um, I totally spaced what, um, we're talking about, uh, the, uh, kind of, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, things that we're talking about today and in, in this reading about how the revolutionaries were kind of running around like chickens with their heads cut off along with everybody mm -hmm. else and how like, you know, basically the Leninist model, the Leninist form of organization is to say, you know, like we need a tightly controlled group that's a, like a, a, a strong nucleus of, of leaders who can, who are ideologically trained who and who are not just, you know, uh, book smart oh, on theory, oh, but who are also like, right. you know, fighting oh, in the trenches with the workers. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. They fucked up. 
uh, they were trying to do the decentralized model, but they weren't doing it like in in, in, a, in a proper way. Like uh, the idea is not to have like no real like like command structure whatsoever. It's it's to lay it out horizontally. In, in, in such a way that it, it wouldn't really denote like levels of rank or like such a like tiered command structure um it still it still functions as a cohesive unit it's just that whoever takes charge or decides to take charge in the moment they hold that until they don't it's really situational and it, it works pretty well um in my experience uh from uh uh, uh, in 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 non-revolutionary contexts, um, I used to uh, do a lot of uh, combat sports, specifically ones with uh, like a team aspect, and I found that it's it's not necessarily a rigid squad structure that would work uh, the best for uh, me and the team I was running with. In, in paintball, airsoft, uh, competitive shooting, all of that. Uh, there, there, there was, uh, it was not really like a rigid structure, like like a regular squad, like how there would be like uh, someone who would take points, someone who would be like a, a captain or like a lieutenant or something like that. Those rigid rank structures don't really work too well with a lot of people. So if you're trying to organize like, say, regular regular folks in that kind of a situation like hurling them into a rank and file situ a rank and file scenario is not gonna like work too particularly great um but um that 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 seems to have been one of the main problems at least on a on a um uh engagement standpoint like from a combat perspective that this particular revolution was having is uh, um, their their entire like um, uh, command structure was just it was it was pretty much non-existent on the ground, and that's an issue. Um, if yeah, that was that's a good contribution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry if I sound, if I'm no. incoherent. I'm, no, I'm running no. on caffeine and hope. No, that's okay. no it's fine. <laughs> um, we're having a very we're having a discussion among friends here where everything is good. Um, to um one of the points that you were making, uh, I think I would offer uh, that while I am not a Marxist Leninist myself, I'm most sympathetic with Marxism Leninism, and I'd say that. Yeah, it's always good to be like as as uh, horizontal as you can, but a Marxist Leninist would probably prioritize uh, the awful exploitation of um, capitalism over top of uh, you know hierarchy. So exploitation and hierarchy, obviously, like two different problems. And I think that um, like like if you have to have one of those two problems. Or what, like like uh, a Marxist Leninist would probably rather get, get rid of exploitation, which isn't inherent to uh, hierarchy. And in the case of um, having a vanguard party of professional revolutionaries, not everybody has the time or the energy or even wants to be involved in uh, you know thinking about um, historical materialism or dialectics or the tendency of the rate of profit to fall or any number of those uh, political economic concepts. Uh, and so it's, it's not that Marxist Leninists want there to be hierarchy because hierarchy is a good thing to have, but rather that uh, it's practical to have some people who like are revolutionary PhDs uh, leading some people who don't have revolutionary PhDs and it's okay not to. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the perspective is really, amounts to a, a practicality and yeah it's not so much like rah rah hierarchy is great like i don't think I, i'm not a, a fan of saying that sort of thing especially coming from kind of the position that i am uh, but I like either. jewish uh, trans girl but like you know <laughs> like actually i think it's um you know i, I don't want to misquote here but there's a 
something on, I think, from Mikhail Bakunin about, you know, like when it comes on issues of authority, when it comes to the, you know, making shoes, I defer to the authority of the shoemaker when it comes to the, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I think that, you know, I think there's a kind of, that's the element here that we're concerned with is a little bit more about like, okay, you're our enemy. The fucking bourgeoisie is like well-organized, has their shit together and is, you know, ready to slaughter us at a moment's notice. And so, uh, like maybe having a force that's like, not necessarily like organized in the same way exactly, but like something that's tightly organized and able to like cohere around a very like disciplined political program, which is to say, you know, if you want your movement to succeed, it really helps to have very specific demands, right? The more specific your demands and the further you're willing to go to get them, the more likely you are to get them, right? So, I mean, that's, at least that's my take. Anyway. um, um, I wasn't referring specifically to the way that they were organizing their program. I was referring to the way they were organizing their fighting force. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, That's different. Yeah. (laughs) I was, uh, I, I am, I am more well-versed on, uh, like battlefield and martial stuff than I am the more political end of it. Yeah. Like, um, uh, what I, what I was getting at was uh, you fight how you train. You you default mm-hmm. in that stressful situation to your highest level of training, mm-hmm. or actually, no, your lowest level of training. Yeah. You default to that. And um, if your lowest level of training is nothing, then you default to nothing. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> that, that seemed to have been a lot of the problem. It's because they didn't have the time... Uh, on hand to put in that level of training necessary to really be effective which is why like I'm saying maybe, maybe like if 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 people are like looking to do this sort of thing and that they need to at least like look into what's necessary to be able to operate effectively mm-hmm. as a, a, as an operator themselves yeah, uh, yeah. but on 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 uh, on the on the case of authority in in a, a political sense, um, I feel that there are certain hierarchies that are are justified and they 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 like they exist uh, when they need to, uh, much like sure. a parent child or like uh, people defer to an elder or something along those lines. Those are fine. Mm-hmm. It's when it gets to a point of uh, some massive entity that is uh, coercive by nature, like a state or mm. something along those lines. That's when I run into a problem. Okay. Well, this has been a nice detour in our conversation. Um, I was wondering if we want to kind of, I mean, like, I, as I kind of um, said at the outset of our discussion here, there, it's very difficult to draw certain parallels it from what happened you know 100 years ago in germany to the contemporary united states just because things are so different and like we don't you know they had at least parties calling themselves socialist and communist and so on uh we are in a decidedly more primordial state so i think there's certain comparisons that we really can't make but at the same time like i think there really are some lessons to be gleaned here so and some folks in the chat were kind of alluding earlier to you know what are the lessons that we take away from this in terms of like you know what does it mean to like work with stockdoms or this this or that tendency or whatever um so yeah i'll just pass that off back to you guys um to maybe discuss a little bit before we wrap things up today. I think in terms of working with sock dens and things, there's enough fluidity in play with as, uh, with as, uh, I guess the word would be infantile as the socialist movement is in this country, that there's a lot of different tendencies that can just work together for certain achievable, like immediately achievable goals. Like, like the United uh, Front type thing. Yeah. And I think that is perfectly fine in the context of where we are now i think it's going to get a little hairy and a little little more questionable the closer we get to an actual like revolutionary situation because at that point it's how are we going to handle this and 
who's going to snitch? Who's going to fuck it up? Who's going to come to a point where they can't, like, hack it anymore and we need to, like, do something about that? That is when it becomes an issue that we need to work with. Yeah, that's that's when uh, the Jacobin folks start feeding us to the cops, right? (laughs) Yeah, and that's that's, that's when we start putting shivs in necks, but uh, in Minecraft, of course. Oh yes, no, always in Minecraft, never anywhere else. There are shivs in uh, Minecraft now? Nice. <laughs> Simba, what are your thoughts on that? Um, okay, I mean, I guess I, it's a really big chapter, and so um, I, have, I have a lot of them, not the least of which is that a general strike will, will uh, be about 10 trillion times more effective, or a general strike could be uh, 10 times more effective than any election ever uh, mm-hmm. in the history of humankind. Um, but, I mean, uh, barring that, like past that, I guess um, you can't really, as far as I can tell, draw a parallel between uh, the different factions cooperating with people, but whoever you do cooperate with uh, it's important never to compromise your message mm-hmm. uh, at at risk of making people angry. Because uh, people who have their their uh, their their class interest, uh, they're going to have it. Like whether your message is radical or not. I mean, we live in a, a place where where fucking anybody to the left of of fucking Sauron is is a communist. You know. Like, uh, and so, and so, like, uh, in this situation, I mean, like, they called Rosa Luxemburg, like, an anarchist and shit. Like, what, what is that? Um, but I think it's kind really, of the same thing you're talking about. Like, anyone to the left of Sauron is the commie. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's like, they're gonna, like, call you names or whatever the fuck, but, like, you're not gonna attract people by being dishonest and, like, making your message like uh more more palatable or anything like that i mean these basically what i'm saying i guess is like if people would call you a communist and demonize you or i mean even in the worst case of scenarios lock you up or kill you for even if you don't succeed then if you are really like a truly revolutionary person you should say like exactly what is what is on your mind uh, or or whatever, because the class interest that exists isn't just something that the classes like doing. It's an imperative. It's something that they need to do uh, to to win, right? Like the the contradiction between the proletariat and bourgeoisie is antagonistic. Somebody has to win. In order to win, the bourgeoisie will like at some point uh, shell the shit out of their own. Uh, fucking newspaper building, you know, if that's if that's what it takes for them to hold on. Um, and so, like, we should be prepared to say or do, you know, what it takes, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it, like, I think we're um, getting pretty close to wrap-up time here. I don't want to keep mm-hmm. you guys uh, too late into the evening. It's like nine o'clock on your end right so Mm -hmm. um but so yeah just thinking about like the fact that we are barely into this book like we're on page what like 230 something 200 and can't remember offhand like 250 Uh, i think it's like 200 250 or 60 out of 900 some Yeah, yeah so like we're not even like we're barely maybe like just over a quarter of the way through this book and we've already just seen some absolutely devastating demoralizing shit um and like this is i mean this is why i think this is why i think this um study series is like such an integral um thing to look at for us as revolutionaries and for the folks who are watching for you know, because we just, you know, we are living through in not just in the United States, but really in the world situation, capital is, you know, starting to really consolidate its class power around 
um, you know, more fascistic or, na- uh, you know, ultra nationalist regimes all over the world, like, you know, Modi in India and, you know, Johnson in the UK, Trump in the United States and, the, you know, the, uh, all the other, you know, many. Bolsonaro. Bol- yeah, yeah, of course, Bolsonaro in, in Brazil. Yeah. And, you know, there's, so, so I think there's, you know, no, it's not simply, I think, you know, I think all communists have kind of a responsibility to talk about this in this way, not just the German revolution specifically, but like this idea of like, every, you know, I think it's Walter Benjamin who said something like behind every fascist state is a failed socialist revolution. And I think there's really like, there's something to that. Like it's not, I don't think it's necessarily true in every single case, but like, there's a very real sense in which if we are not, it's not simply a matter of defeating fascism, because if you don't take out capitalism, you're, we're just going to end up right back in the same spot, like, yeah. you know, the years down the line. So our... Gotta get that double kill. Yeah. Our mission <laughs> has to be, you know, an, an uncompromising... Uh, war against you know imperialist hegemony and capitalism and you know if we not uh if we don't fight that to the to its bitter death then uh it's just gonna keep coming back and that's why i think you know and this is my little soapbox moment i think this is why you know uh the bernie sanders campaign is just like we're just asking for, for a Friedrich Ebert here. Like we're not, I don't think like I, I hear folks use the term like damage control. And I'm just like, is in what sense is this damage control? If we're just like <laughs> inaugurating a new, you know, different face to the imperialist system. Like this is not going to be any better for, it's you know, not pe- so pe- much damage control. I think that what they're looking to say probably is harm reduction. Um, yeah, I mean, but, like, that's exactly, I mean, I, I mean, the same thing, though, but, yeah, mm. I just, yeah, I mean, healthcare sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I that's guess. my comment on that. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've got a $6,000 deductible on my fucking insurance, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty pumped to maybe have, like, I don't know, maybe free yeah. a point of service, you know, as a treat. As a treat, yeah. The proletariat can yeah, have a little health care some... as a treat. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't think that anybody is out here voting for Bernie Sanders because they think that he's gonna bring back the fourth international or whatever. Yeah, uh, I guess, I guess fifth, the fourth one is Posadist. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, It'll no, I guess, I guess what um, I'm, I get a guy maybe just not to maybe lose myself too much in polemical excess, but like the point is more like I think there's this kind of starry-eyed way that like especially like the folks at like jacobin and chop ho <laughs> bernie where it's like oh okay. he's the great savior of socialism and we're gonna have socialism if bernie wins and oh my god he bernie at best. by the way by the way bernie have you heard have you heard about bernie this is an amazing <laughs> guy <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, yeah, like that's Bernard. that's that's yeah saint bernard <laughs> <laughs> the bernard brotherhood Lord, I guess that's kind of more what I'm pushing against, and I, I'll check myself on kind of veering into polemical excess, going on the whole Bernie killed Rosa train. But you know, <laughs> no, I actually love that. I think I it's think a great meme. Like, it's a great that's meme. The, the best meme of this uh, stream. Meme stream. <laughs> is the stream meme? Um. So, is there I any do... kind of? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add, I mean, just as a last thought, I mean, it's exactly as I said, uh, and I think Melody agrees that it's we we like need to win because we need to win. We need to not yeah, be yeah. in this position and uh, they do what they're doing because they need to win. They're in this position like they impose poverty on, like uh, the bourgeoisie imposes poverty on people because they have to not because you know, it, uh, like, like not every billionaire thinks the same way, but it's not because they want poverty to exist. It's because that's what they have to do to maintain uh, their position in society. And so, you know, voting for somebody or, you know, or sorry, not being a militant revolutionary and, and uh, 
refusing to learn from history will result in us being in the same exact position. Yeah, as Melody said. Yeah, so um, I think those are maybe some good closing thoughts. Um, Izzy, do you want to say any closing remarks? Uh, no, 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 that, that, about, that about does it, actually. Sim- okay. Simba nailed it. So um, to kind of uh, fulfill the the requests that I've been getting for f- from folks who are interested in kind of hit- hearing more uh, historical documents, I'm going to read just not the whole thing, but I'm going to read a, a, a quote at length um, from uh, Karl Radek's uh, eulogy uh, of Karl Liebknecht. Um, so I'm just going to read kind of the last couple sentences of it. Uh, or the last couple paragraphs of it um, to close us out for tonight. Um, Just real quick, though, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And, oh, hell yeah, ACAB in the chats. Keep that going. Um, Thank you, everyone, who's joining us today. I hope that you learned something uh, from this uh, discussion and summary. Uh, I'd like to once again remind folks that if you felt a little lost today, that's okay. So are we, because we're just you know, ordinary people studying this difficult book. Um, And if you are uh, wanting to kind of get caught up, you can go on my channel and look at the old streams. Um, They're all archived on a playlist that says the German Revolution on it. Um, And if you enjoy this project, if you enjoy what we got going on here and you want to support me and my other videos and stuff, please um, do consider supporting me on Patreon. Uh, it's uh, over at patreon.com slash a world to win. Um, you know, I, uh, I got to pay the bills. So <laughs> that's all. That's, mm-hmm. that's my, that's my pitch. Uh, if you like my project, you want me to keep putting these on, uh, keep putting out my other videos too, please consider becoming a, a supporter. You know, just a, a dollar a month can really help. So um, with that, I will close this out by reading this uh, couple, last couple paragraphs from uh Karl Radek's eulogy of uh, Karl Liebknecht. Liebknecht was not alive to see the new times. The first wave of the proletarian revolution bore him further than he wanted, tore him with it. In the storm, he did not see the distance far enough. When the January uprising was suppressed and the social patriotic government pursued him, no one dared urge upon him the thought of flight, even though it was clear that his imprisonment contained the danger of death. He wanted to fling himself against the pogrom incitement. On the day the assassin's bullet struck him, he he brought up the idea of calling public meetings in the next few days. Then he fell into the hands of the executioners who wanted to strike him and Rosa Luxemburg, the German, the international revolution. He fell in the first phase of struggle, full of confidence and consciousness of victory. He fell as he lived, captured at the battle position. And we, we who knew him intimately with his merits and his weaknesses, we who understand the immeasurable loss of the revolution suffered when his iron warrior, when this iron warrior was torn from its ranks, we say it at his grave. For us... He will be a model of loyalty to socialism, of devotion and courage, without which the revolution cannot triumph. Liebknecht was not only inspired by a deep insight into the objective necessity of communism, but but the still deeper personal yearning for the complete harmonious life that is possible only on the basis of communism. And this yearning sprang from an infinite love and kindness a sympathy for every suffering creature, a readiness to give assistance without uh, without which socialism is a delusion. The world knows only Liebknecht, the heroic warrior. Broad sections of proletarians who applied applied to him as an attorney received humane assistance from him, loved him as a man. Liebknecht's courage was the union of his love for every man and his discernment that in the period we live in, individual suffering cannot be helped without beginning the life and death struggle for socialism. He fell 
in the raging struggle, and thousands will follow him to the martyr's death until naked, hungering, uh, wound-bedecked humanity will have the leisure to remember its martyrs with love. Soldier of the revolution, his father called him. To Karl Liebknecht fell the honor of earning this title with death in the struggle. The Soviet Republic has created the insignia of the Red Star for its most valiant son. Lay it on Liebknecht's grave, and may all of our friends know no greater honor than, through the achievement of this insignia, to approach the spirit of Karl Liebknecht, who went the road that we want to tread to the end, even should each of us win the Red Star only in death. Thank you, everyone, for joining us once again. Um, that was uh, the last couple paragraphs of Karl Radek's uh, eulogy of Karl Liebknecht. And I think it's really a, a testament to just how important and how beloved uh, this man was. Uh, not just, I mean, there's a, another eulogy of Rosa Luxemburg that perhaps uh, we can share during the next stream. But uh yeah, I'm seeing now that there's uh, 16 folks joining us live. I wish uh, mm -hmm. wish you guys had shown up a little earlier. <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> just have to. They can check the box. Be, be a little really salt. Be a little salty about it. Oh, uh, thanks for joining us, though, folks. Uh, we're gonna call that a, a wrap, though. So. Um, Thanks again for joining us, and make sure to uh, check out my co-hosts' channels. Uh, do you guys want to do a quick uh, sales pitch for your channels there? Okay. Um, my channel is Izzy Does Everything. Uh, I, I, I uh, rant about things from an anarchist perspective, and I also have recently started doing like trans existence vlogs because in this fucking like nightmare world uh hellscape that we live in uh just existing as a trans person is apparently a radical political position so i might as well uh, be the representation i want to see so uh, i'm doing that so uh go check that out i guess if you want i'm not gonna like force your hand or anything but i would really enjoy it if you showed up anyway simba it's it's yours all right yeah uh i'm young simba um I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, black and indigenous issues because um, those are the things that I'm just like most well versed in and uh, of like in American history. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate you all coming out here and listening to me uh, blabber about whatever it is comes out of my mouth. Uh, please hop on over to my channel, Young Simba, and uh, c gently caress that uh subscribe button it doesn't it doesn't like to be uh hit i know some people say uh you know smash that subscribe button it's just it's a fragile being so yeah just needs a, <laughs> just needs a, a gentle we only touch smash bash around here so yeah if you folks who are watching if you enjoyed the stream um the link to it will uh once i've ended the stream will give folks a link to uh the complete video so if uh you saw a part of this stream and you want to see the whole thing, it'll be available. And if you uh, enjoyed what you see and you want to share it with all your comrades, uh, make sure to send them a link to, uh, and subscribe to my channel. And I already said that. And, um, thanks folks. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the stream before I keep blabbering on for too long. So thanks so much for joining us and have a great evening, anyone. Hi. Um, Wandy Wexler Wesson says, uh, who's talking? It's me. It's Melody. It's the channel host. Take care. Mm -hmm.